Aaron Benjamin Barnard, Benji to those who knew him best, was a 35-year-old father from Boise, Idaho. He was an entrepreneur and got along with everyone. On December 4, 2004, Aaron was at McDonald's and unexpectedly got a call from his roommate to come home. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. Not to start 2018 all philosophical, but also a bit obvious, I guess. Life is a series of choices. In fact, making New Year's resolutions is all about making different selections this year from what we did last year. You're going to eat better, work out, save money, dump that lazy boyfriend. You know what I mean. And some come to fruition, and many don't. But making the choice is only half the matter. The other half is what happens due to something you change in your life. And what we begin to see is how our choices not only affect us, but they affect other people in sometimes the most unpredictable of ways. And it's only then, and to get philosophical again, that we see that life, not just ours but everyone's, both those who have come before us and those who will be here after us, We are all part of one infinitely long chain of cause and effect. We make choices, things happen. People make decisions based on what we do, and the link goes on and on and on, with causes creating effects, then those effects sparking other causes, etc. to infinity. In disappearances, we are asked quite often to consider this. What caused a person to disappear? We know the effect... It's the disappearance. But why did it happen? That's where we try to find the cause. With Aaron Barnard's case, we already know the effect. He's missing. But you're going to be confronted with many different possible causes. And I have to tell you, I myself don't know what to think at this point. But there's something else. You're going to be asked to consider if Aaron's disappearance also caused another man to disappear. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's site, charlieproject.org. On a usual weekend, as part of a custody agreement, Aaron spent time with his son Ian. He would have his son from Friday to Monday and had been doing so for several months before his disappearance. However, on the weekend of December 4th, 2004, which was a Saturday, things had been changed up. Mike, a friend of Aaron's, was in town and they made plans to meet at 10 o'clock that night. They hadn't seen each other in a long time. Due to this, Aaron dropped Ian off early with his son's mother that Saturday. From there, Aaron went to a McDonald's drive-thru. While driving there, he was on the phone with another friend of his, Yvette. She lived only a couple blocks away from him. And while talking to Yvette, Aaron got a call on the other line from his roommate, Tyler. Tyler had been living in Aaron's house for six weeks. Aaron answered his call. When Aaron got back on the line with Yvette, he told her that Tyler wanted him to come home immediately. This was no big deal since Aaron was headed there anyway. Yvette and he got off the phone. Aaron was never seen again. During the investigation, Tyler made contradictory comments saying that Aaron never arrived, despite Aaron's car ending up in the driveway. On another occasion, Tyler said he took Aaron to the airport. His stories have never been reconciled. In addition, Tyler was found to be in possession of some of Aaron's things after Aaron disappeared. However, Tyler has never been charged with anything, not even theft, in regards to Aaron's disappearance. Yet, this case only starts there. Several other people in Aaron's circle may have had grudges against him due to his prior business and personal relationships. And Aaron's case may be connected to another disappearance in Boise a couple years later. Aaron's family believes foul play is involved, nobody has been charged in Aaron's disappearance, and the case remains unsolved. 
The interview for this episode is with Vicki Barnard, Aaron's mother. Unfound news. I was going to do a year in review show, kind of a rundown of what happened with Unfound in 2017, but frankly, there just wasn't any time. This past Saturday alone, I spent about eight hours on the phone with future guests. So I had the intentions, but just couldn't make it happen. I apologize. Next, myself and my assistant, Emily, you've heard me talk about her before, are continuing to work on the Pennsylvania list. This is a group of disappearances, one of which will be selected to be the first case covered through a collaboration between Unfound and the people at Trib Total Media in Pittsburgh. I anticipate the first in-depth article to come out at the end of this month. Finally, many projects are in the works. You can expect Volume 2 out very soon. New t-shirts that will be unique compared to all other true crime podcast merchandise out there. And hopefully by the end of this month, I'll be able to give you some TV project news. Whether they're going to happen or they fell through. Hey, Hollywood is a tough business. Either way... All of you will know everything that is going on with Unfound. Where you can find Unfound, and I've kind of shortened this again. Unfound is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, Podbean, and Spotify. You can email the program, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. The website, unfoundpodcast.com. Please check out the secret Stephen Kocher episode. The website at Trib Total Media triblive.com forward slash news forward slash unfound unfound has patreon and paypal accounts thank you to the most recent contributors dan rose and helen unfound merchandise volume one is on amazon in both paperback and ebook form the playing cards go to makeplayingcards.com and do a search for unfound and please mention unfound on all true crime facebook pages and other websites and forums Thank you. So happy to have on this episode of Unfound, the mother of Aaron Barnard, Vicki Barnard. Vicki, welcome to Unfound. Thank you, Ed. I'm pleased to be here, and I thank you for airing this information about Ben. You're welcome. And maybe we should uh, touch upon that right at the beginning. His actual name is Aaron, but you call him Benji. Why is that? Can you explain to listeners? Well, Okay, thank you. He was um, named Aaron Benjamin Barnard. I always wanted a little brown-eyed boy, and I called him Benji, and the name fit him. But as he grew older and he was in junior high, there was a Disney movie of a dog named Benji, and he got teased a lot about that. And one day he said, Mom, I'd like to be called Aaron now. And so many of his grade school and junior high friends have always known him as Benji and call him Benj. We used to say Benj, don't, don't, but, um, but those friends that he met later in life know him as Aaron. And so I apologize that sometimes I will use both names in the same sentence and it's very confusing to people, but Aaron has people that call him Aaron, he has people that call him Benj. All right, thank you for explaining that before we get started. I think that'll be very helpful to the listeners. So uh, listeners, we may alternate between Aaron and and Benji. Vicki, tell the listeners a little bit about your son, and what was it like raising him? Did he have any brothers or sisters? What were some of his interests and hobbies? Well, um, he he was an only child. I had him when I was 20 and uh, divorced when I was 21. So family, he and I, his father was not active in his life. Uh, he was uncaring and absent, totally, um, no financial support, nothing. So Ben's always had a hurt deep inside about that. But he's a great son. He was very thoughtful, considerate, caring, worried about me as much as I worried about him. Um, we talked often on the phone and discussed what was going on in each other's life, uh, daily activities, happenings, concerns plans, all kinds of things, just like you would a best friend. I was very aware of what was going on with him, who he was seeing, if he was having any fun, if he was working too hard. Um, we were very close. How did he do in school? Um, was he into sports or music, anything like that as a teenager? 
he was not into sports. He didn't really like sports much, which was odd because I loved sports. I think that sometimes God blesses you with an opposite. You know, I don't know whether he learned from me or I learned more from him. It's a um, gift interest, but he was gifted and very into music. Um, he uh, he actually dropped out of school, which was a heartbreak for me. But he was he had a very high IQ. He was in a good and talented program. It was a very new program when he was in grade school, and uh, there was like one instructor for the whole city of Boise. So. Had that been more established, I think we would have been able to keep him in school. But he dropped out in his um, uh, sophomore year. And he went in one day to the library um, and asked if he could take the um, GED test. And he took, uh, they said it would take two days and he needed to study for it, but he challenged it and he took both tests in the morning and passed and got really, really good high scores. So he was he was intelligent. He had a near uh, uh, photographic memory, not quite photographic, but very, uh, very uh, distinguished memory. And music was about the only thing that kept him in school as long as it did. Huh. Um, did he so play? Did he play an instrument, or did he sing? What did he do? Oh, oh, he he played um, the violin. Wow. We called it fiddle in our family. Yeah. He played the bass, the bass violin in a jazz band uh, when he was in school, and then um, he worked at Dorsey Music in Nampa for six or seven years, I think six, and then um, that's a neighboring town, Nampa. And then he moved back um, to Pro Sound near the Boise Mall and worked in that music store. So he was in the music business, and he. Um, wrote um, keyboard music for some runway uh, fashion shows. And uh, he had, there was at one time in my life where I had to sit back and think, oh my gosh, my son is worth more than I am because I had a wash machine and a dryer and a, some household furniture and a car. And he had like 13 electric guitars and some of them were, Worth a good amount of money, so you know he um, really was into that. He played in a band too for a while when he was about nineteen or twenty. Seemed like so uh, seems looked, like a very yeah. industrious guy, especially if he dropped out of school. Let's say at sixteen years old, but he just jumped right into the workforce and started making some good money. And he was uh, very outgoing and ambitious. He was. He worked. He had a great work ethic. Um, he was, uh, I, I think, our whole family, from aunts, uncles, cousins, mom and dad, brothers, sisters, we've all um, have a really good work history. And he did have, um, his father that was absent in his life was married four times, and he has a total of, I believe, eight children. So Benj knew two of them, the half-siblings. So he actually had siblings he'd never met. And I think he would have loved to have met them. Sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, disappeared before before yeah. that whole connection was made. Yeah. Were you worried about, I mean, we know that uh, he ended up, of course, getting uh, some decent jobs, making money. But when he dropped out of school at 16, were you worried about him? What, you know, what he might get into? Oh, yeah. I, I was very worried. And for a while, I think he was, we talked about this as he was older. But I think he was quite depressed at that time, and I didn't recognize the signs. He didn't sleep at night, hardly at all. He read uh, voraciously, and sometimes he'd be reading at 3 in the morning, and I didn't recognize the signs of that. That was what was wrong, but I think he was quite depressed. But being a single mom, if he wasn't going to go to school, then he had to pay his way and work. And so... um, you know, I laid the law down, I guess, so to speak, that he had to yeah. get a job. And he worked um, when he was 14 at a very large grocery store called the Alessandro's. Then he worked in sales at a car dealership, and he got some great sales um, training there, then went into music stores. Uh, then he worked in a college shop called Mr. Pond, and it 
uh, he worked to manage it, and that's where he learned about firearms because uh, there were firearms in the pawn shop. And then he eventually got a set of firearm license and opened a retail store. And he got out of that business and then started a sport bike shop. So he was an entrepreneur. And in between those um, those jobs, he also, you know, would uh, barter sometimes, find something he'd buy and trade for someone else. Also, he did work uh, for a few months um, as a DJ in a strip club as a second job when he was at, I think he was at this That's what the police chose to put out about him, that he carried a gun and worked in the strip club. But that was just such a fraction of who he was. Yes. Yeah, and we're going to, yeah, and of course we're going to cover so, some of those things uh, in the upcoming conversation. But it's safe to say that Aaron was not afraid of work. No, he was a hard Sure, Surely not. So, but he seemed to also have what I even have in re- wrote in my notes here, uh, an, elect- an, an eclectic taste in business, going from, you know, a DJ <laughs> to uh, a music store, you know, gun store owner, motorcycle shop. I mean, that's a wide range of different types of work. It is. It is. Uh, he got a, a special knack for seeing a need, for instance, the fish store. He started this fish store. He built all of the racks and, and, and set it all up, and it was just all tropical fish. And then he expanded the business to um, service fish tanks in, like, dentist offices, uh, corporations, things like that. Um, so, and, and really no one was doing that at the time. So, um, and the, the sport bike shop was very successful too. They were all used, she didn't have new bikes because there were, uh, shops that had, um, uh, licenses to sell certain brands, but all of these were used. They were great bikes, but they were, um, fixed up and, and made to look like new and, and sold as used bikes. And there was a need for that. Yeah. Now, apart from his work, um, he was a father too. What can you tell the listeners about him having a child and how, how that happened? Uh, when did it happen? How old was he? Um, oh gosh, I'd have to do the math in my head too. <laughs> um, um, he, um, let's see. I can't remember. He had a daughter with the love of his life. Um, her name is Tiara, and uh, he, they were very much in love. And they had a daughter out of wedlock, and they planned to uh, get married. But uh, did it sort of backwards, so they had a child first. He uh, died in a car crash, and the baby was in the car. Oh, my. At the time, yeah. But the baby was unhurt, and um, the uh, grandparents took the child. It was on the Nevada highway. They went down, got the baby, and then um, basically said to Benj, well, she's not yours anymore. I could quote that. She is not yours anymore. So there was an 18-month child custody battle, uh, and eventually the judge didn't even rule on it. He just throughout the case, and his daughter went to live with uh, an aunt and uncle. It was very heartbreaking. It about destroyed him. But he um, pulled himself together, and um, this is how he got into the gun business, actually, because when he was managing the pawn shop, the grandparents of the child uh, always kept choosing and changing the days that he could visit, and it was a two-hour drive to visit her. So twice a week, he would drive to Twin Falls, Idaho to visit his daughter, and it would be Tuesdays and Thursdays, then they'd change it to Wednesdays and Fridays, and it was Mondays. And so Ben, uh, you know, couldn't keep a job with all of those changes and having to be gone during the week. So he eventually uh, started going to gun shows and, and doing his own business there. He actually got the uh, federal firearms license. But he did that because it's the only way to make good money and be able to see his daughter during the week because the gun shows were always on weekends. Uh, So that about killed him. And then 
when he started the um, retail store called the Gun Monkey on uh, Shinden Boulevard, uh, years later, uh, he met uh, Tracy, and um, and they had a child, and, and he had asked her to marry him. As it turns out, she was seeing another man at the time, and um, they ended up uh, not getting married. She married the other man, and uh, they were in another custody battle. This time, um, they ruled a joint shed custody. So he has a, a daughter who now, since Ben has been missing for 13 years, she just turned 20, is married and is going to have her first baby huh. uh, in any day now. And then the son now lives in Florida, Orlando, with his mother and a stepfather. And um, How old is the son? He is 16. Okay. All right. So uh, he has two children, a uh, daughter that's, uh, that's 20 now, a uh, son that's 16. Um, the one mother was killed in a car crash. The other one is here in Orlando with the stepfather. And he has these businesses going on. Seems, seemed uh, like he might have been a busy guy back there, 2003, 2004. A lot going on. A lot going on yeah. in his life. He always had a lot going on. That's both, what he always did. Both publicly and personally. Yes. Okay. Um, the listeners should know that this is probably one of the most complex cases that Unfound has ever uh, covered. And so I, I mention that because we're going to be mentioning a few names here that you're going to probably, the listeners are going to have to keep track of as we move forward because they play an important part in the rest of this uh, case. Um, Vicki, uh, I'm going to ask you just to, a, a few names. And just explain to the listeners who these people are, not necessarily how they play a part, but just who they are before we get into the rest of this. Who is Yvette? Um, Yvette uh, was a a good friend of my son's. They talked many times a day. She said sometimes for hours. So she was at the time sort of a, I don't know if she was his best friend, but a very close friend friend at the time they were not involved romantically they were friends okay and she lived uh, maybe kind of close to him in Boise she lived, yes very close about um three to four blocks away okay on a on a major street so it was very very close time-wise too okay who is Tyler Tyler um was um, a new acquaintance of Aaron's, and he moved into an three bedroom to that house he owned. And Tyler moved in as a favor to someone. Okay. And how long would you say that Tyler lived with Aaron before Aaron disappeared? I don't know, but I think maybe two or three months. Any idea how... To this day, Aaron and Tyler met. I don't know that for sure. Don't. Uh, he was a new acquaintance, um, but I, I don't know who introduced them. I okay. have suspicions, but I can't say. Okay, and we're going to maybe get into that a little later. And finally, who is Constance? Constance um, is an attorney in Boise. Um, I think Aaron went to her for some legal advice once. I can't recall what it was for. But they met, and then they started dating. And she was his girlfriend for a while. They started the sport bike shop together, and then they broke up. Okay. And she is a little bit older than Aaron, isn't she? Or she wasn't she? She's 20 years older than Aaron. Did that did that surprise you? No. Okay. Was as Aaron all was Aaron always maybe attracted to older women? Not always, but sometimes in his past he has enjoyed older women. I think they um, when he was younger he did because they held good conversations and mm-hmm. I think they stimulated him mentally and um, 
he, you know, he doesn't have a biased bone in his body. He uh-huh. um, is just um, open to, even in school, he had friends that were new waivers, athletes, you know, music people, nerds. Uh, he just liked all people, different people of different interests and ethnicities and everything. But yes, it didn't surprise me when I found out how old she was. I wasn't very happy about it, but you know, he was an adult. So. And it should be known that Constance, at least at the time, I mean, when did they first meet? How long did Constance and Aaron know each other before he disappeared? Years, as a matter of fact. Maybe. I would say not lots of years. I would say um, probably she helped him and then they started dating. And so I would say probably two years. Oh, okay. So just two years. Okay. But and it should be known that Constance does not look her age, at least not back at the time. So it was not obvious that she would have been that old, much she, older than him. Yeah, she's pretty well preserved. Um, she's had some uh, work done and, okay. and she looks a little younger. Okay, great. Or did. And once again, how do you think they met again? Through I think that he probably went to her for some legal advice on something. It I don't know. Yeah, she is a lawyer and could it have been something to do with one of these custody issues that he had? It's a possible I think it might have been the first custody battle. Okay. Um he might have um contacted her or it could have been the second one I, I don't know but I do recall that he had met her through some work or, or advice I don't think she took any of that she was actually sanctioned when he was uh, fighting for custody for, with his son and she could not practice law so she had um, done something that got her sanctioned I think it might have been the second time but I'm not positive on that. Mm. So it, I don't think it, I don't think he met her when he was fighting for custody of his son. I think it had to have been something else earlier. Okay, right. And once again, a little later, we'll get into the part that she has uh, a little bit of history just on her own with her law career. What do we know uh, 13 years later about the day that Aaron disappeared? That would be December 4th, 2004. What did he do that day? What was he supposed to be doing that day? He had his custody of his son. Okay. What went on that day? Let me uh, let me just tell you. First, uh, he disappeared on a on a Saturday. Right. I spoke I spoke with him on the Friday before, just the day before. He was in an excellent mood. We were planning Christmas. He had his little boy there, and um, and um, we had talked about. Uh, I am a trike, so he was going to go measure him uh, that weekend and call me back. So I was expecting a call from him. We talked. We quickly there was a a point of him calling me back, and then um, on the day that he uh, the the day before he disappeared, uh, or two days before, he paid a very large uh, water bill. Where if you were going to make yourself disappear, you wouldn't be spending one hundred and sixty dollars on a water bill. So those were things that were of question. And then um, on Saturday, um, he had taken a friend of his who was a certified gun instructor to Yvette's house, his friend Yvette. And um, she liked to target shoot, but Aaron wanted to make sure that she had safety training. And um, and so he took uh, Bob by her house. And I only say this because she knew what he was wearing. She knew the mood he was in. And both Lizette and one of her daughters said he was in a great mood. He was so excited to meet his friend, Mike, who had moved out of town and he hadn't seen him in months. And so uh, Aaron was so excited to meet Mike. He could have hired a babysitter because he had uh, custody of his son um, at the time, who was three. But... His son was quite shy, and Aaron decided rather than have a babysitter, he just took him back to his mom, and Tracy agreed, and that was fine. So he took the baby back to a neutral spot they had chosen where they would hand the son back and forth, and that was the McDonald's on uh, Cole Road in Boise. 
And so he went to, to dropped off the child, and then he was coming back. And we know some of the things because he was on the phone with Yvette. We knew that he had just gone to a fast food restaurant, picked up dinner. We knew that he was on the phone with Yvette when he said, I'm just about at your house, which is just no more than four blocks from his own. And uh, the phone rang. And my son always had his cell phone with him, and he never let a message go to voicemail. He would always put you on hold and answer it, and then say, I'm sorry, I'll have to call you back. But while he was talking to my vet, his roommate called. He was at the house waiting for Aaron. And so... Aaron then put Tyler on hold and went back to Yvette and said, Yvette, I've got Tyler on the phone. I need to hang up. I'll call you tonight after I get back from my um, evening with Mike and um, and tell you, you know, all the fun I had and see how the movie went with you and your girls. And so then he went back on the phone to Tyler. And by that time, he had to be almost home. Mm -hmm. And we never heard from him again. Tyler said Aaron never made it home. But we know that's not true because his coat was there and his car was there. Uh, was Let me uh, ask you this. Are we sure that when Tyler called Aaron that, that Tyler was at home? Is that, is, is, that only, for, is that for sure? That's only what he said. And it was a, it was a cell phone, so we don't know. Yeah. Um uh, but that's what Tyler told Aaron that, uh, that he was waiting there. And they were supposed to meet there. I did ask Tyler when, uh, in the very beginning, when I was, you know, trying to find my son. I said, why would you call him, say I'm waiting for you at the house, and then leave before he gets there when he's probably, you know, 15, 20 seconds away? And he stammered and said, you know, stumbled over. He said, I said, did you, did you just hurry and run out to your car and run off all of a sudden, even though you're supposed to meet him? He goes, uh, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I did, which makes no sense at all. Right. So Tyler, uh, is not making a lot of sense at this point. Uh, but just to go over that real quick, Aaron's out, he's talking to, and I just want to get this name correct. How do you spell, uh, the girl's name? It's Yvette, Y-V-E-T-T-E. All right, so I'm saying Yvette, you're saying Yvette. Okay, so Aaron is out. Um, he drops off his son back with uh, the son's mother. He goes to get something to eat. He's talking to Yvette. She, they're on the phone. Tyler calls. Aaron takes that call. Tyler says, come back to the house. That's what, And then Aaron tells Yvette this. And so the belief is that at this point, Aaron was headed back to his house where Tyler was. Yes, and we know the location because when he was talking to Yvette, he said, I'm almost home. I just passed your house. Okay, very good. So, yeah. And then later that night, Aaron was supposed to meet this longtime friend of his, Mike. Uh, when Aaron didn't show up that night, uh, December 4th, did Mike try calling him? Uh, what did Mike think happened? Is the Have the police or you ever talked to him about that night, what he thought? Um, I did talk to Mike, and Mike said that he called Aaron about 9 o'clock, just to verify. And all he got was the message machine. Uh, not the machine, but his voicemail. Went right to it's very odd, because Aaron had two or three identical phones. And rather than charging them like most of us do, we come home, we charge our phone, he just would always have one charging and he'd, and he'd flip out and change the batteries. And so he never had the phone he used with all of his numbers and everything ever charging. He just changed the batteries. And Aaron always answered the phone in all the times that, that I called and talked to him. I don't know if more than once or twice did I ever get his message machine because he'd always wake up and say, Mom, I can't talk. I'll call you back. And he'd, you know, go on. But he would always make that effort to say, I know you're calling me. I'll call you back. And Mike said all he got was the voicemail. Why that said the same thing. And then days later, of course, all I got also later that weekend, I guess Sunday I called, um, was his voicemail and 
and then one of his friends looked into it, and when you get a particular voicemail to what he said, it means that the phone is off. Yes. Most likely, yes. Or or maybe the battery has died. That, that, I think yes. that's a possibility as well. So Mike calls him. What did, do you have any idea what Mike thought? Did Mike think that Aaron just blew him off or something came up? Any idea? I, I don't think he knew what happened. And, and he had talked to Aaron and, and he was very excited to see him. In fact, Mike had told me, I saw in my notes the other day when I was reviewing, that Aaron uh, gave him a big hug when they had met and made these plans to... Um, to go out together, and he said it almost seemed like he had tears in his eyes. He was just so excited and glad to see him. Mm-hmm. And so Aaron was very upbeat that day because he, you know, he just was going to see a friend that he dearly loved and was looking forward to it. Okay. So he, um, something happens. He just doesn't show up to see Mike. Mike doesn't know what to think. When did you know that something was wrong? That maybe something suspicious happened? This is um, this is something that I regret. Um, I kept thinking, what is wrong with him? Why won't he answer the phone? And I would call him and say, Ben, just call me back. Did you measure t- the little one with the tide? Are you okay? I kept calling him. I could never get a hold of him. So then I started calling his friends. But being a travel agent for many, many years, I thought, you know, I wonder if he went somewhere. This is really stupid, and I regret it, but I wonder if he um, had gone out of town and, and the airfare at the time he had to stay over a Saturday night um, to get the best spare. And so I kept telling myself, don't be a stage door mother. And just wait until you hear from yeah. So I waited until the next Sunday. That was a whole week okay. um, before I, I finally asked the police to do a welfare call. I didn't know they would do that. And then I w- called the police to report him missing. And they didn't respond. They wouldn't return my call. And then I called a couple times. And then finally, when I got hold of them, um, the little boy's mother, um, Tracy, had already filed a report that day. So the report wasn't filed for a week. All right. So what you're saying is by the time you got around to it, the, the mother of Aaron's son had already filed a missing persons report. Yes, because he didn't make it back. He, he dropped the little boy off on Saturday around 6.30 or so. And... Um, he was going to pick him up the next morning to finish his weekend. He had a Friday through Monday um, custody right. visit, and he um, was going to pick him back up and continue the visitation, but he never showed, and he never called, and that was not like Ben. Uh, you know, with his son, especially after having a, a heated custody battle, you don't just blow it off. And, um, sure. and so she knew something was wrong as well. Okay. And, and we had talked. Okay. And did you talk to Yvette uh, during that week? Uh, did you know her? Did she go over? Did she have anything to say about that week? Not being able yes, to reach I him, called. being being that she only lived a few blocks away from him. Yeah, she was very concerned. I called everybody like that uh, Monday, Tuesday, you know, right away, and we talked. I just didn't file the report, mm-hmm. and. Um, uh, my vet and her daughter on the next day he disappeared on Saturday, December 4th. And when she hadn't heard from him, I hadn't heard from him. Um, she and her daughter went to his house. They knocked on the door and noticed that all the lights were on and the blinds were open. Toys were on the floor and everything looked normal. They went back to their home, which was, you know, very close, got some dog food and brought it back to Aaron's and dropped it over the fence for Aaron's dog. And she was worried because in all of the travel that Aaron had done for the gun store and the bike shop and everything, he never once left his cat and dog without care. And the dog was very friendly, but would not come to the fence. The cat would not 
come, uh, they just thought something was wrong. So they threw some food over the fence for the dog. When she went over there, let's say that's three or four days after, let's say it's like December 7th or December 8th, something like that. Was Aaron's car there? Um, any any signs yes. that he had been there? Aaron's car was there. She drove by the house several times um, that uh, Sunday and then Monday. Everything looked okay. All the cars were unmoved. He had uh, several cars. Uh, she fed the dog again, and uh, but the dog wouldn't come. So she was afraid that the dog was locked in the house. And we both kept calling him many times, sending him email messages, but no response at all. And then uh, still by, on Tuesday, December 7th now, three days later, when we'd not heard from Erin, uh, she had been by the house many times. We got in touch with um, his best friend, uh, Robert. And I asked Robert if he still had a key to the house. And he said he did. And that he was supposed to have met uh, Benj on Monday, and he never showed. So everybody was very concerned at this time. And Robert let um, my vet in to check on the animals. And, uh, and then they walked through the house and made sure that he wasn't injured. Uh, and they could find nothing disturbed. Um, okay. Did they notice, okay, did they notice but, anything missing, anything strange? And once again, was Aaron's car was there or not? The one that he usually drove? It was still there. It was okay. unmoved. They, they saw nothing strange, except they noticed that Tyler had moved out of the guest room. Huh. Um, and that was, very, and so then, um, the next day, December 8th, my vet went inside and noticed a silver cell phone on Aaron's desk upside down with the back off. Um, it looked slightly scuffed and was not sure if it was, it, it was one of his nicer ones, so she assumed it was one of the duplicates he used to charge the extra batteries. There was nothing else on the desk at the time. They went to the day before and really checked, and then Robert and she checked the message. So when Yvette went back the second time on, I guess it would be December 8th, you said that she saw a phone on a counter. Uh, did she remember that from being the, the day before or, or what? Um, she noticed that, the, that there was a, a cell phone on Aaron's desk. It was upside down with the back off. And it was um, slightly scuffed. It was not one of the nicer ones. So she assumed it was one of the duplicates he used, you know, to charge the extra batteries. And she looked really well on the desk. And this is key because there were no credit cards or IDs on the desk. All the lights were still on, um, as well as Aaron's computer. Everything looked normal. And then Robert checked into the messages on Aaron's cell phone and found that the message meant the phone was turned off. And at that point, then, um, they didn't see anything particularly strange. Later uh -huh. on, though, we did. Right, right, and, and we'll get to that just as we go uh, through the timeline. But just uh, for the record, didn't know any, notice anything unusual. No signs of violence, no signs of a scuffle, nothing like that. The only thing that was very strange was that um, when I had talked to Aaron on Friday, December 3rd, he was um, on the phone in his bedroom with a little boy, um, his son was playing on the computer, and he was on his office chair, and the computer was at the desk. Otherwise, he was too short, you know. And um, the chair to the desk was missing. We never found that. Okay. And that's not the only piece of furniture that was missing eventually, but once again, we'll get to that uh, in, in a moment here when we get back to Tyler. What did the police do? Once they got this report, Yvette had gone over there a few times. I'm sure you were at that point planning to, um, you know, go over there and see what's going on. What were the police doing finally after a week after they got this police report? What'd they do? Nothing. Nothing. Basically nothing. I was so in a panic that I um, took all my vacation time and I went to Boise and 
I jumped ahead, but there was a reason I started packing my son's things. And every day, every morning and every night, I stopped by the police station and left a message um, for the detective who had inherited this case. And he never once would call me back. And so at the end of two weeks, I finally went by the police station and I call, I skipped the detective, I skipped the sergeant, I skipped the lieutenant, I went right to the captain. And I called and said, this is Vicki Barnard, I'm the mother of missing Aaron Barnard. And I'm not happy with the lack of response by the police. Can we talk about this? And he said, sure. And he said, when do you want to do it? And I said, well, I'm parked right outside your office. Do you have time now? I suppose that was rude to me, but you know, it wasn't in my right mind. And he said, sure, come on in. So I got in there, and there were about six people that we all went in this room, and, and they were all on high alert and interested. And they said, so how old is your little boy? And mm. I so they didn't even know anything about the case, which I find odd. And I said, well, he's an adult. He's not a little boy, but he's still my child, and he's missing. And then four of them got up and walked out because, you know, they were ready to do an error alert or something. And and so the captain and the lieutenant and I sat down at this small table in the lieutenant's office, and they said, what do you think happened? I said, I'm at a total loss. My son wouldn't do this. And their response was, well, that's what everybody says, but it, trust us, it happens. And I thought, okay, so they're a little hardened. But I said, seriously, my son and I are very close. And I just don't believe he would do this. He would disappear on his own. So I think something happened. And they said, do you know how many people walk away? And so they took this sort of attitude that, you know, Aaron had done something. And, he, and so I said, well, I don't know. You know, I didn't want to push a theory of mine on anybody because, frankly, I didn't have one. And I didn't want to be this mother that said, oh, my son wouldn't do this. I wanted to know the truth. And to know the truth, you have to be open to any possibility. So I tried to be in that state of mind, even though I was probably in a state of shock and panicked. My whole body was buzzing. And so we're talking, and I said, do you think he could have gotten schizophrenia? I knew nothing about the disease, but I thought maybe he was the right age, and I think he was a little bit old. So... Um, I said, maybe he was injured and he has amnesia or, you know, have you checked the hospitals? Or, And, of course, we had already checked the hospitals. But I, I just came up with all these ideas. And finally, the lieutenant looked at me and he said, ma'am, you need to just accept the fact that your son most likely killed himself. And that threw me so, I don't think it was all there the rest of the of the discussion because I thought they haven't even looked into it yet and they're telling me he killed himself and I said why do you even say that and he said well it's almost Christmas time it's December 4th that he disappeared so you know he was probably depressed I said no everyone knows says that he was in a real good mood and they said well maybe he's in a high maybe he's bipolar do you ever have him checked and I mean it, they just had all of these bizarre things and I said well I don't think that he disappeared on his own. And at that point, the lieutenant got up from the little table, went over to his desk, grabbed his lunch, opened up a bag of Cheetos, sat back, crossed his legs, and started eating Cheetos. I thought, oh, my God, I'm interrupting his lunch. I I just was so offended and hurt and couldn't even find support from the police. So I left with my head spinning. And it didn't get any better. The detective was hostile and rude. Uh, he would never return a call to me. I think in seven months he returned one phone call. Any idea why the police were so rude to you? I was, um, I will have to say I was distraught, but I was always respectful. And um, I think that, I think that, um, Detective Morgan was just burned out, and he uh, eventually quit, you know, quite soon after we parted this. But um, I don't know. I think it was a terrible 
thing that they do uh, to people who need their help and then to treat them so badly. I have no idea. Okay. But then the new people who took over, you're much more pleased with them, haven't you been? Yes, actually, um, Detective Morgan uh, retired and I or, uh, or left the force, and um, you know I think that improved the force a great deal. I have another say on him, and the captain uh, then also left. And Chief Masterson did a great job of replacing those two people, and the new sergeant that came on board, uh, Sergeant Barnett, was absolutely marvelous. And a number of detectives took the case. Um, you know, they move around a little bit. And eventually we got one, and, and the Sergeant Barnett freed up time for him to actually really research the case. And I know many of Aaron's friends are so upset that the police have done nothing. But in reality, they really did eventually investigate this case. But by the time they got it, was cold already. But the Boise police did a good job after we got rid of the initial uh, rude ones. Okay. Now we're going to get into some more of the particulars. And I had already told the listeners earlier that this is a, a very complex case. A lot of different people, some suspicious characters, um, some stories that just don't seem to add up. And so we're going to start all of this by going back to Aaron's roommate, Tyler. I'm going to, for the record, still 13 years later, we're still not sure why Tyler was living with Aaron. You've said because maybe Aaron was doing a favor for somebody, but the roommate before Tyler was this guy you've already mentioned, Robert, who still had a key to Aaron's house. Has Robert, who was friends with Aaron, ever been able to tell you why Aaron went to him and say, hey, man, you got to leave? What was that conversation like? Actually, Robert moved out, and uh, they had been there for um, maybe a couple of years. Um, and then uh, when Robert moved out, Aaron had another friend, John, move in. Okay, and John. And John wasn't there. Yeah. And John, um, I hadn't met. I have since met him. Nice guy. But John um, told me that Aaron... He'd only been there a couple of weeks, and Aaron said, John, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to ask you to leave because I have this other guy that's going to move in. And um, Aaron had told me that it was a, a favor to a friend. So I think that whole thing was suspicious of moving in this other guy who was not his friend and having his friend John to make room for this guy. And did John know Tyler? Had they ever met each other before and how did John feel did feel John feel at the time that there was something suspicious about him being kicked out or on the other hand do you think maybe that Aaron kicked John out maybe because he didn't pay the rent or something no um I think John was hurt and at the time um Aaron Aaron was starting to um I don't know if hang is the right word, but he'd met an old um, classmate from grade school and that he hadn't seen in a long time. They got reacquainted. And that guy uh, hosted poker games. And I think the bench was dealing with um, different friends than he'd grown up with and uh, or that he'd been associated with. And um, I don't know. I, it seems to me they're more in the gray area or maybe even worse, but um, he met this friend that he'd known in grade school. He'd actually been in my Cub Scout den back when they were what, eight, ten years old. And uh, his name is Andy. And Andy uh, hosted poker games, some high stakes poker games. Ben's always is looking at where he can make some money. And he had a nice house in a nice neighborhood. And he had built on a beautiful new garden room, all windows, and he laid some slate and marble on the floor. And and then, so Aaron decided he would order a professional poker table and uh, set that up and host. He wouldn't host the games. Andy would still host them, but he would rent his house because the games were usually in cruddy houses. 
and and Ben she thought, wouldn't it be nice to have you know a nice house? And Ben would charge them for the rental, and he would cater. And so they tried that for a month or two, and it never worked out. Nobody came, or only one or two people came, and so he ended that. But during that time, that's when he told John he was going to move Tyler in. And I wonder if maybe Tyler was supposed to be some sort of security. That's only my guess, but I think it's a pretty good guess. Yeah. And what was John? Was, what was what, John's what? guess, though? What was John's guess? Exactly. Did John's? Did John have any inkling at all? Did he know about the poker games? And did he think that? Yes, he's the one that uh, told me that. Aaron said, "I'm going to move this other guy in. I don't think you'd want to be here." You know, we're going to, um, I don't know if he said security, but he kind of laid out the picture and it wasn't real, real clear, but that's, that's the picture that John painted that, um, I need to have this guy here. Um, and I, you know, I only have room for him and I need him for the business or the poker games. And so that's what I, I mean, that's the only thing I can think of. Okay. Now, Tyler wants to... I don't have all the facts on that, but that's what John told me, that he had to move him in for um, for reasons to do with the business, and then it didn't work. There is this story with Tyler and some of the furniture in Aaron's house. What happened with that? Um, it, the, the furniture... Aaron had... Um, a leather furniture set that was a couch and two reclining rockers and um, leather and a ottoman. They all matched. And um, it, it was interesting because I have a, a nice leather set as well, but I liked his better because of the chairs. And at one time we had talked about maybe we would swap. And, um, and that was always something that we mentioned. And so I know that Aaron would not have sold uh, the set without talking to me. And uh, he was happy with it in his house. He had uh, bought a nice three-bedroom, two-bath house and uh, had settled it nicely, was working on that. And then after he disappeared, his furniture was gone. Uh, we did ask the police to do a welfare check at one point, and he had, the police had broken into the bedroom and walked around and walked out and I think he thought there was just no furniture there because when we asked the lady he said well I just never thought about it so um, Aaron's friend who lived nearby and was feeding the animals like that uh, she was at the house once she ran into Tyler this is soon after Aaron disappeared and uh said, what happened to the furniture? And Tyler said, I don't know. And she said, I think you do. And he said, no, I don't know. I said, so that's funny because the neighbor saw you loading it up and taking it away. He goes, oh, all right. I, now I took it. So we know that Tyler's furniture. Lied about it and then got caught. And how long do you think this would have been after Aaron disappeared, going back uh, to the date that he disappeared, uh, that Saturday? Uh, was it a week after? Was it two weeks after Aaron disappeared that that he took that furniture. Well, Tyler moved out the second day after Ben's disappeared, which is strange in itself. And the furniture, I believe, was within the first week. Could have been the second week, but it was quite soon after Aaron had disappeared. So you could take from that that maybe Tyler thought that Aaron wasn't coming back. You might be able to look at it that way. Uh, I don't, I don't yeah. think that he would take it if he knew maybe um did Aaron or did Tyler ever say anything like well I took it because Aaron sold it to me I took it because Aaron owed me money and I thought that this would be a way for him to pay me off anything like that did he ever say anything like that no he did it and we did find on uh, his Facebook account uh, later a picture of uh, Tyler and his uh little girl sitting on the couch and it was not at Aaron's house. So it, I believe that he didn't sell it. I believe that he probably gave it to someone, either his brother or someone else. He knew a friend because clearly he was visiting um, and sitting on the couch uh, months later. 
Uh, do you know where this furniture? So you're not sure where this furniture ended up. All you did was see the pictures, and you just know that it wasn't in Aaron's house. It was just somewhere else. It was somewhere else, and it was somewhere where Tyler took his daughter and was relaxing. Maybe it was the mother of the child. I don't know, but yeah, I don't know. Where any it went. any idea who might have helped Tyler move that furniture? No, I don't. No. Okay. So that's uh, something that's fairly suspicious, but, and he seemed like he tried to lie about it. You'd think that if he, if this was something that was above board, that he would have told Yvette or anybody else, well, you know, Aaron sold it to me and Aaron was going to be getting new furniture. He didn't say anything like that. Um, no. Tyler uh, had some multi uh, a few multiple stories about Aaron and the disappearance too. Why don't we start it off with, uh, he allegedly took Aaron to the airport. Yes, Tyler um, uh, first started uh, saying, I talked to him personally, and he said he had no idea where Aaron was. He hadn't seen him, didn't know. And then uh, within days, he was telling people that he'd taken Aaron to the airport. And then, like, and out of his mouth the next day, he's asking people, well, have you seen Aaron? I haven't seen Aaron for days. I don't know where he is. But I actually told everybody to go to the airport. So, that was very confusing and, and, um, you know, different stories, conflicting stories. Did he ever say, I mean, being that he has multiple stories, I mean, we're going to have to guess that at least most of them are lies, but did, if we're to even believe this airport story, did he even say, well, Aaron said he was going to fly somewhere. Did he ever say, well, he's flying to Mexico, he's flying to Florida, anything like that? No, he just said he took him to the airport, and um, that's, that's all we know. But so here's the funny part, is that if he was just going to the airport to go somewhere, even if he was fleeing, he would have taken his um, um, shaving kit, and that was sitting right on his bathroom counter. He always was reading a book, and uh, he didn't take the, the book that he was reading at the time. Um, he didn't take any of his clothes. He didn't take his coat. Um, nothing like that. Plus, Tyler also had told people that Aaron uh, took his suitcases and his uh, packed his suits. And first of all, Aaron didn't have any suitcases. He had duffel bags. He traveled with duffel bags. And his suits were all there, still in plastic. Aaron had lost some weight. And had uh, some of his suits. He, he 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 normally just dressed in jeans and t-shirts, but he liked to get dressed up once in a while. He liked to go to the opera. He liked to to just get dressed up, go on a date, whatever. And uh, he had some nice suits from different um, jobs he'd had, and and he liked to dress nice. He had um, a number of them altered, and they were still in the plastic in his closet. Plus. Uh, whenever he wore a suit, this was winter, and it was very, very cold out. It was like five degrees when I was at his house was because my car locked. Uh, I couldn't get the, the door froze shut. And it was very, very cold. And if he was going to take his suit and go somewhere, he would have taken his suit coat. He had a nice overcoat. That was there. All of his jackets were there. It was all bogus as far as I'm concerned on what Tyler said. Did Tyler ever give you a reason, being that you did get to personally talk to him, of why he moved out just a couple of days after Aaron disappeared? Yes, this was bizarre, and I have to admit I was pretty stupid about this. But uh, it, uh, uh, Tyler told people that he moved out immediately within two days of Aaron's disappearance because the house was in foreclosure. And he knew that because when he came home one day, there was a note stuck on the door from the bank. And that blew my mind. And I thought, well, you know, I've never been in foreclosure. And um, do they do that? And so I panicked because my friend said, Vicki, if his house is in foreclosure, well, um, foreclose on the house and take all the cars that are on the property, all the furniture, his clothing, they will take everything. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I was told by good friends. And so I panicked. When I went over there, I was not only looking for my son, but packing up his house at the same time to get his things into storage to protect them from being taken by um, the bank. The bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And so that was very stressful. And um, then I, I, I called the bank, Countrywide Mortgage, and asked them if my son's house was in foreclosure. And no one would talk to me, of course, because of privacy, and I was not the homeowner. And I went, I called them a couple of dozen times. No one would talk to me. So finally, I got to a, a senior vice president and gave him the DR number for the police, said, contact the police if you have any questions. Just, I'm his mother, you know, let them tell, verify that and tell me, is my son's house in foreclosure? That's all I want to know. And he said, I can tell you that. And no, it's not in foreclosure. And so that was a lie, not that lie that time was told. So when you got over there, and I think that you've said that you went over to Aaron's uh, place and uh, you were living in Oregon, I guess, at the time. Were you living in Oregon when Aaron disappeared? Yes, I was. Okay, so you got over there about two weeks after he disappeared. That's when you, around that time, sometime in there is when you found out about this foreclosure story. And that's when you started to pack everything up. And then some at some later point, you found out you didn't even have to do that. Yes. Okay. That's cool. And when I, when I, this is interesting too, because I cleaned up, I, I moved everything out and then I vacuumed everything, cleaned everything up and the house was totally empty. Like it was for sale. Um, no furniture in it, nothing in it. Um, totally cleaned. Yeah. And the reason that's important is because later it was broken into. So. Yeah. And, and we're, and we're going to talk about that as we go through this, a uh, timeline. Uh, in fact, Tyler said that there was like a, a note on the door and you found out the bank doesn't even do that. Yeah. Yeah. They don't put a note on the door if you're in foreclosure. Uh, so that was stupid on my part. I didn't know I, I, what happened. So that was a whole um, story. Okay. Yes. Uh, very strange. Um, but just uh, f uh, for the record, uh, was Aaron having any issues uh, getting his house payment paid? Have you ever learned anything about that since 2004? Uh, Aaron was having uh, financial difficulties, especially after um, he lost the business that was uh, taken from him. And um, he was, I mean, he was doing okay. He was living on his own. But he got behind, and he eventually did file bankruptcy. So uh, the house payments, I don't know if they were behind. That may have been the first thing he did with his money to make the house payment. But the house was still in his name, and it was still in good standing at the time he disappeared. And we also have to remember that even if he missed a couple payments, sometimes foreclosures take for a long time. Take a long time. Yeah, you know, it's not like you miss. Exciting. It's not like you miss one bank payment, and suddenly they come take your house. You know, that's not how, yeah. that's not how it works. The, what I believe is that it was just a reason. Tyler was looking for a reason why he moved out so that he, it, it didn't look suspicious. Whether he had anything to do with anything, I'm not saying that. But he moved out on the second day after Aaron disappeared. And why he didn't just say, I moved out and won't live there anymore. But instead, he made up this story about a note on the door saying the house is in foreclosure. And that, to me, um, was strange. Yeah, of course it is. You have another story from Tyler, and you probably have to tell the listeners when this exactly happened, if you can remember. It has to do with a, a watch, uh, a wristwatch, that Tyler had, um, and he gave it to a, another guy, I guess, as a gift. What is so uh, strange about this story? Well, again, there's no admission of anything. And Tyler, um, Aaron had a, a, a girlfriend that he was uh, dating. It was a casual relationship. He thought highly of her. Uh, her name was Janelle, pretty little girl. She uh, was a single mom at the time and uh, had, I think, four children. And Aaron um, and she would date and I talked to her after he disappeared and um, she didn't know where he was. She was very concerned. And then uh, as we continued to talk, uh, it appears that on the like third day after Aaron disappeared, or so quite soon after he disappeared anyway, uh, Tyler had contacted Janelle 
And I said, did you know Tyler Janelle? She goes, no, I only met him once when I was at Aaron's house. He introduced us. We didn't even visit, but, um, you know, and that was the only time I'd ever seen him. But he called her. To me, that's sort of out of the blue, but maybe they were commiserating together. He was saying, I don't know where he is. Do you know where he is? And she said, no, I'm so concerned about him. That's sort of comforting each other. And then Tyler um, was calling her all the time, and they went out a few times, and he professed his love for her. So she was a cute girl. I've never met her, but I've heard that she's very cute. And so Tyler had fallen in love with her. Well, one time they were going, and this all happened very quickly. So um, I believe it was within the first few weeks, month at the most, that I talked to Janelle and this came out. Um, and when I found out that they were going out, I said, um, I just want to warn you, I don't know if Tyler had anything to do with Aaron's disappearance, but that there have been some um, conflicting comments from him, so I would be careful. And she got scared and um, wouldn't take his calls anymore. But before that happened, I'm sorry, I'm going back. Before that happened, Tyler came by one time and picked Janelle up, and they were going on an outing to Burlington. Burlington Coat Factory. And uh, while they were driving, he picked up this watch. I said, what do you think of this? And she said, oh, my God, you've got Aaron's watch. He said, that's not Aaron's watch. He said, yes, it is. He said, no, it is. And she said, it looks just like it. That was the end of that conversation. And when they got to Burlington, they went in. Tyler was looking for a watch. He bought a watch, took the watch out of the case, and put Aaron's watch in the case. And he had told um, Janelle that he was going to give it to someone. So we don't know if it was a gift to a friend, um, if it was a payment of sorts or a proof of kill or just a gift. We don't know what it was. But for the longest time, we could never figure out who he'd given it to. We had a lot of theories that we just couldn't figure it out. It was years later, probably four or five years later that the police interviewed a friend of Tyler's by the name of Jason Coley. And Jason admitted he had Aaron's touch and that Tyler had given it to him. And that, that verified the story that Janelle had told you years before. Yes. And not only that, Jason also had Aaron's personal handgun. Aaron, uh, I had mentioned, or I don't know if we mentioned it, but he had a federal firearms license mm -hmm. and a retail gun store at one time. Aaron went to a lot of gun shows. He'd also worked in um, this upon where they had guns. He saw lots of different guns, but this particular one he had kept year after year after year. It was his personal handgun. He did never, he did never want to sell it. He did never try to. It, that was his gun. It fit him. He was comfortable with it. That was his. And all of a sudden, Tyler sold it to Jason Coley. Hmm. I do not believe that Aaron sold that gun to Tyler. I believe he took it. But that's just my opinion. Okay. So we just have to keep some, some things in mind. Uh, Aaron's gun might have been unique, but it probably wasn't a one-off one gun. There's probably many guns in the world that might look like it. We just can't be sure. But this watch, it wasn't like a $30 Seiko. It was a fairly nice watch, kind of unique, much more unique than a gun would be. And it, and I the one that Janelle saw was the exact copy of the one that Aaron wore all the time. Yes, it was a Movado watch. It was a silver metal strap with a black face with a diamond at the upper part, upper center part of the watch. There were no numerals numbers on the watch, um, just the hands and the diamond in the black face. It was a beautiful watch, and uh, Aaron had had a number of watches, Jarvis five type, but this one he always kept. So there are certain, and I believe also, I would have to look back on my notes, but I believe Aaron's gun, that we did have the serial number on that gun, and it was Aaron's gun that okay. Tyler sold. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, serial number would surely verify that the the gun that Jason had uh, used to be uh, Aaron's. Uh, so you said that Aaron had some other watches. Were they found in his house after he disappeared? 
they he had watches at one time and he had sold them. They were uh, nice watches and he had sold them, I believe, when he had money problems. So the only watch he kept that he would never sell in Yerky Yerky was the Movado. Was the one that seemingly ended up in this guy Jason's hands. Um, yes. Okay. Is there any chance that, you know, being that Tyler seemingly took the f- furniture, that Aaron disappears and the, his watch is there, and Tyler says, well, while I'm taking the furniture, I'm just going to take the watch and the gun too? Or, or do you is that is that possible, or is it more likely something else? It is possible, but I'm guessing the watch was on my son's hand. It wasn't on his desk when we went and looked. It wasn't in his bathroom or in his um, shaving kit. The watch was not in the house after Aaron disappeared. So, I believe that it was probably on my son. Plus, he was going out that evening to meet his friend Mike, he would have had his watch. And uh, uh, so, yeah. I just felt like I needed to ask you that. Being that Tyler took, uh, you know, the furniture and didn't seem to be too shy about it, seemed to create a story here and there, but it's hard to hide furniture. Um, I'm just wondering if in the process of taking the furniture, he saw the watch there and just said, well, I'm going to take that too. We just don't know. But it certainly yeah. is suspicious. Did he ever give Janelle a... An explanation why he went to buy another watch and then just use the box. Uh, can you not just buy wristwatch boxes? I, I'm not a wristwatch guy. Maybe you might know something about it. Did he ever give her an explanation for that? I don't know. We would have to ask you now. I really don't know that. Okay. Um, it, it, I'll tell you what, what's difficult, and, and I think your readers or listening, listeners will understand this, is that Going back 13 years, nobody has the same phone number anymore. Yeah. You know, I, I would love to talk to Janelle again and, and other people as well. That's why, um, you know, the, the police are key in working these cases because it's hard to find this. Everybody, Aaron's age, you know, at the time were on cell phones and they've changed the providers a number of times. And it's hard to go back and ask questions because I can't find these people. Yes. Yeah, well, maybe um, that's something we can work on. If you haven't talked talk to Janelle in a while, maybe um, uh, my listeners and myself, you know, maybe somebody can help you with that if you want to track that's her down great. again. Okay. That's All right, listeners, great. so you, you've heard that. Um, what is Janelle's last name? Do you want to say Janelle's last name um, while we're at it, or do you want to leave that off the record? Janelle is um... – an innocent bystander, as far as I know, she just happened. I think she knows more than she thinks she knows. Her name is Janelle Finley Brown Lord, and uh, okay. uh, I believe she still lives in the Boise area. Okay, thank you. Now there was something else about Tyler, and he had been bugging Aaron about this for a while. That Tyler, at one point, I, I don't know how how bad he got beat up, but he got into a fight, and maybe this other guy got the best of him. But he had wanted to get some revenge on this guy for a while and kept trying to get Aaron involved in it. Um, can you explain that a, uh, a little bit more? And what was the status of that when Aaron disappeared? Sure. It's a, a strange story to me. Um, Aaron um, was a more of a negotiator, a talker. He was always a peacemaker on the playground. You know, he's, always, he's a Libra. He's just a... Uh, um, negotiator. He's never, to my knowledge, and we were very close, ever been in a fight. One night, he was in a bar, and Tyler and his brother uh, on the other side of the bar. Aaron was talking to the cocktail waitress, who was a friend of his. I think it might have been Janelle, I'm not sure. But all of a sudden, this a uh, young, fairly small or, or middle-sized Hispanic man, young, uh, poked Tyler in the nose, bloodied his face. I don't know what was going on. And Tyler's brother immediately got hold of this guy and stopped him. And anyway, uh, Ben immediately left. He told the cocktail waitress that I'm out of here. He left. 
Well, Tyler wanted to go and get revenge on this guy, rough him up, beat him up, steal his money, whatever. And he asked Ben to do it, and Ben said, no, hell no, I'm not going to do that. It's not my fight, and I don't do that sort of thing. And he kept pushing him and pushing him and pushing him. And I know that this is true because Aaron told this to me himself. And then his friend Yvette said, this guy just keeps, Tyler just keeps pushing him. Ben keeps saying no, and it's like he won't drop it. And then as the time got further and further, Tyler seemed to be more urgent about it. And so Aaron was going to meet Tyler at his home that night. He had to go do something with Tyler. I don't know. It's not like Ben should agree to do that. Maybe he was going to go and talk to the guy. I don't know. But um, I don't know if Tyler was trying to lure Aaron or if Aaron just felt he needed to get him off his back and, and go meet this person or what. But there was something that Tyler was pushing my son to do. Uh, Tyler couldn't get um, anybody else to go with him to do this? Tyler seemed, seemed to know to other people. I mean, Tyler and Aaron hadn't known each other that long. Tyler had only been living with Aaron for not a very long time before Aaron disappeared. Did Tyler not? I wonder. I'm just maybe it's almost a rhetorical question. Uh, Tyler couldn't ask anybody else to do this. He could. He and his brother used to get uh, involved in uh, situations like this often. He has a brother that's like six foot. I don't know what. And very large. And they used to go and um, get into a little bit of trouble on their own. So he could have asked his brother. He could have asked Jason Coley. He could have asked Clayton, the mechanic in the bike shop. They were all his friends. Aaron was not his friend. He was um, staying in my son's house. And so, yes, he could have asked a number of other people, but he only wanted Aaron to do this. I don't know why. How long did this uh, poking of the nose how long before Aaron disappeared did this happen? Do you know? A month before? Three months before? Any idea? You know, I have to apologize, and I do have a timeline, but it's not fresh in my mind. And that's, I a, just, that's that's okay. I you you just give it just uh, just an approximation would be fine. I would guess that he was after him. I would say two weeks. So for two weeks, maybe maybe only ten days, because when I was at Aaron's house cleaning it up. Aaron had the master bedroom with his own bath, and then Tyler had the guest room, one of the guest rooms, uh, the guest room, and the other bedroom was for Aaron's son. It was um, decorated for a little boy. But uh, in the guest bathroom, there was um, uh, peroxide and uh, cotton swabs that had blood on them. And I believe they were from Tyler of that at that time that he, I don't know, it could have been that evening bench disappeared. I don't know. But, um, so I think it could have been within, um, a week or 10 days, two weeks at the most, and it wasn't cleaned up. Or that could have been from something that night when he disappeared. I don't know. Okay. And just, just to be clear again, was Aaron there when Tyler got hit? He was in the bar on the other side of the bar. They saw a ruckus going on when, when Aaron saw that it was Tyler uh, or that it was a ruckus, he said to the cocktail waitress, I'm out of here, and he just left. Okay. He didn't get involved in it at all. Okay, just wanted to make sure just wanted to make sure that was clear for the listeners. He didn't even walk across to see if Tyler was okay. He just got out. He just left. One more thing that we're going to talk about, uh, Tyler, before we move on to another couple of uh, uh, suspicious characters, uh, characters with histories. Uh, there was, uh, we have to remember that Facebook's only been around uh, not quite 10 years. Before that, there was MySpace. And Tyler was on MySpace at that time in 2004 into 2005. And he and a friend of his on there had kind of a back and forth about a very rude joke. What can you tell the listeners about that? Um, yeah, I, I was following uh, Tyler's uh, MySpace account and some of his friends just looking in and at one time I can't remember the exact words but there I have it printed and I should have pulled it out for you and I'm sorry but there was a discussion on my space where Tyler said something about okay I'm making this episode what it was but a friend will 
help you do this. A friend will help you do this, do that. A friend that will help you bury a body uh, is priceless. Something to that attune. And, and there, there's a me. commercial. There's a yeah. There's a commercial that's been yeah. running for a, a long time. Now that was very popular one time. I think that it's like a credit card or commercial or something. You know, something is two dollars, something is five dollars, but having somebody like this is priceless. Yes, and that it was, was an ad and that's campaign. exactly. Yeah. Yes, it was exactly that, but it didn't say anything about burying a body. Yeah. And um, so that kind of uh, got my attention. And other people and the police said, oh, that was just, uh, it was go- people say that was going around all the time. But it was not going around when you're talking about a dead body. It was talking about a friend, you know, in crisis. And then, so I checked to his friend, Jason Coley, and Jason wrote back to Tyler um, plastic, $10, a shovel, $20, a friend to help you dig a hole at 2 a.m. priceless. And if they were just talking, you know, fine, but digging a hole and burying a body, I didn't think was funny. And I thought it was wow. odd that it happened at that time. And once again, I realized that, you, you know, it's been over 13 years now, but just to maybe put this in the timeline, how long after Aaron disappeared do you think that that happened, that they were telling that joke? Well, I remember I was in Portland when I saw it, and I had been to Portland for two weeks, came back, went back over for another week, uh, came back. So I'm guessing it was uh, a month. A month after Aaron disappeared, and I they're could, making jokes about burying people. Yeah, I can look it up, and I can verify the day that it was. But... Um, but it was, you know, fairly soon after. It wasn't immediate. It was, it was. Let's put it this way: definitely within the first half of two thousand five. Yes. Okay. Time enough that obviously they felt comfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To make now, fun of something like that. Yes. Uh, now, if this all this isn't enough of a kicker regarding Tyler and all of these these facts, what did the police? Police did talk to him. It's, I don't want the listeners to get the idea that, you know, he just went on his way. Police did talk to him. What did they say about him? And to your knowledge, was Tyler ever asked to take a polygraph regarding Aaron's disappearance? Well, let me say again that in the, initially the police detective was not only rude, unkind, uh, uncaring, but um, he didn't do very much. He did do some things. And I pushed him and pushed him to get bench in NCI system, to get in AFIS, to, you know, I mean, it was almost impossible to get him to do any of that just basic thing that you normally would do. And I said, would you talk to this man? Eventually, he did talk to him. And I asked him one day, I said, did you talk to Tyler? And he said, yes, I did. And I said, well, what did you think? He said, I thought he was a pretty nice guy. I liked him. And well, that's not very encouraging. <laughs> Not encouraging at all. But uh, eventually that police officer did leave and he retired, thank heavens. And um, new police officers came on board. They took the case seriously. And it did take, I think it was at least three years before they actually, at least two, maybe two years before they actually interviewed. And they did polygraph, uh, kind of. And do you know the results of that test? I do, but I'm not. To, I'm not supposed to say anything. Okay. I will tell you. I will tell you this, however. Within a week or less, within days, Tyler left Boise and moved to Las Vegas. After his polygraph test, he moved to Las Vegas. Yes. Now, uh, Tyler eventually, though, did come back to Idaho, he didn't he? Gone. Yes, he was gone for three years, and then he came back. Oh. And he is back in Boise now, still hanging with the same friends, uh, Jason Coley and and his cousin and others, and, and Clayton. And they all seem to know each other and are living lives, uh, a nice, happy life. Okay, so we have to remind the listeners, Jason Coley is the guy who got the watch. Jason Coley is the guy who 
uh, had uh, had Aaron's gun, and he's also the one that he was joking around with Tyler on MySpace about Aaron, well, not Aaron disappearing, but the joke about burying somebody. This is who yes, Jason. And one other, one other thing about Jason is um, he does seem to hold a job. He got married. You know, he, he seemed like an up, uh, upstanding guy. However, and this is nothing illegal that he did, but I find it strange that as soon as the police went to uh, talk to him, he lawyered up immediately and would never talk to the police at all. Okay. Uh, did Tyler, what is Tyler's last name? Dean, D-E-E-N. All right, so the, the unusual spelling of Dean, instead of like uh, uh, Dean Martin, it's D-E-A-N, it's actually D-E-E-N, two E's. Yes. Okay. Tyler also never really worked before. He was what we all called a couch sleeper. He moved from one friend to another and then to Aaron's house. And he didn't have to pay rent. He, all he had to do was pay, I think it was a cable bill. Um, I don't know if he helped out with electricity, but, but uh, friends that stayed with Ben, she didn't actually have them pay rent to him. He just had them help out with utilities. And um, then after Ben disappeared, after Aaron disappeared, Tyler seemed to have a lot of money, according to Janelle. And uh, then he started doing tattoos, and then he got into um, Muay Thai and is now a Martial arts. Builder. Martial arts yeah. and bodybuilding. Yeah. And so he, I don't know if he turned his life around, but he certainly looks like he's happily married now. And, and so something there... Uh, instigated uh, um, maybe it was just age that he finally seemed to become more sustaining in his life and uh, somewhat more responsible. So, how, how old was he at the? Uh, was he around Aaron's age, or would you say that he was younger than Aaron uh, back in two thousand four? How old do you think he was back then? I think he was younger. <laughs> Excuse me. He um, Aaron was thirty five. I think Tyler was probably. Late twenties, okay, maybe thirty, so, uh, a little bit younger, I think. Okay, so maybe he's uh, early, late thirties, early forties now, something like that. Okay. Yes, I think so. Does, uh, do, to your knowledge, does Tyler have a criminal record? Uh, I don't know that because I don't have access to that, but I, I think he, um. I think he was a bit of uh, a rebellious, a rebellious teen, and was into some lightweight trouble in high school. And this is according to high school friends that said he was often into some sort of scuffle or or trouble. I don't know if it was anything big. I don't know if it was. I don't know what it was, but that's what I heard. The next person we're going to talk about, we've already mentioned her a little bit, is Constance. This is the woman that was in Aaron's life. Um, not sure they were exactly a couple at the time he disappeared, but they were serious at one time. But they also uh, had a business relationship. Uh, Constance it was and is still a, a lawyer in, in Boise. Um, but she and Aaron had a falling out over this motorcycle shop. Maybe you need to explain what happened to the uh, in this situation between her and Aaron. Um, first, Aaron was an entrepreneur at heart. He'd own a, a fish store when he was young, and uh, um, and then he started the the retail gun store, and then he went into the motorcycle shop and uh, was going to do a limousine company. He had this entrepreneurial uh, mindset and. He um, he and Constance were dating. I don't know how serious it was. I know that um, it was intimate. And um, she was an attorney. I think that Aaron met her when he went for some legal advice at one time or another. Uh, it could have been when he was fighting for custody of his uh, daughter. She did not handle the case, but she might he might have gone to her and she referred an attorney in Twin Falls or something. I'm not quite sure what legal advice he needed. It might have been about one of his companies, but he met um, 
constant, and they started dating. And then they, as I understand it from the mouth of my son, and Constance has a different story, so I'm just telling you what I know. Oh, yeah. You can only tell us what you know. Vicki, yeah. we understand that. You can only say what you know. Okay. Well, as I understood it, um, Constance, being a lawyer, an attorney, um, she put up some money. She put up $30,000 to start this um, sport bike shop. What they were selling were used bikes, and they would fix them up. They looked like new. They were beautiful, and they would sell the used bikes. There was a need for that in town, and the business took off. It was very successful. And uh, initially, she put up $30,000 and um, was the owner of the shop. She put a lien on Aaron's house, and the agreement was that um, once they sold or made $30,000 in profit, not sales, but profit, then um, they would be equal partners. And she would release the lien on his house and they were, would be equal partners. I know this to be true because I have a copy of the, or the, uh, the agreement. Also, my son told me, and then Clayton was a mechanic in the bike shop. His name was Clayton Peterson, and um, he wanted so badly to become a third partner. And I was in their presence where they both were talking about this at the shop, and Clayton said, I want to be a partner too. And Aaron had said, Clayton, you need to run the mechanic side, the service side, to the point where it makes money. We're brand new, and, you know, you're working on bikes for your friends and you'll work on them for a week and charge your friend $30. That doesn't make any money. That costs us money. So we need to get you working more efficiently and, and um, using our established pricing. And when it makes money, then Constance and I will talk to you about becoming a partner. I was in the car with my son when Clayton asked him that question again. And the other time I was in my home where Ben's just sitting there talking. I'm only hearing one side of the conversation, but it's clearly the same conversation of Clayton. I've told you before, you know, we'll consider you as a partner at such time as the service side of making money. And then um, one day, Ben went to the shop and Constance had locked him out. And long story short, she sold the business to Clayton and uh, Richard Harris, a man who owns a car dealership in Boise. And uh, they took over. But in addition to taking the business, she also took all of the display cabinets uh, that Aaron owned from his uh, retail gun store, the electronic um, security system that Aaron owned from the gun store, the electronic uh, credit card approval system that Aaron owned from the gun store and then uh, thousands and thousands of dollars of his tools that he bought from Duol and other places as well as uh, metal manufacturing uh, equipment that he had used in the gun store and now was making stops and things for the bikes and those were worth thousands and thousands of dollars they took all of them and just and to be clear, this hap just to be clear, this happened before though Aaron disappeared. It happened before Aaron disappeared, and Constance told the police that he never owned the store, and uh, the police would not share this. But they did tell me, Vicky, you don't understand at all. You're missing something there. So maybe I am, but um, I don't believe I am because Constance also never paid him. I, w I was getting all of Aaron's mail after he disappeared immediately. And he disappeared December 4th. But by January 30th, he had not received anything regarding W-2s, W-4s, whatever it is, uh, income tax. He had received no 1099s. He received nothing. So if she paid him in any way, she did not report it. Um, and if they had some sort of trade out or all, there was nothing he had that I could see. So I, I think she's telling the story, but who knows? 
in any way was Aaron, th- and to your knowledge, once again, just what you know, talking to your son, in any way was he thinking about taking her to court to get his stuff back, to get any money back, any anything I like think- that, to your knowledge, before he disappeared? No, I don't think so, because he was just furious at first. And any of your listeners who look up there and they'll see something on the Charlie Project, which was the re- the first police report that went out. And this uh, this disgusting detective, by the name of Chip Morgan, that was so horrible in the beginning, he put out the worst picture of Aaron you could find. He put out that he was a drug dealer, carried a gun, and had a battery charge against him. Well, you know, calling Aaron a drug dealer is like calling a pharmacist a, a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. And yes, Aaron did have a federal firearms license. He did sell guns. He did carry a gun. He had a, a license to do so. He was in Idaho, for God's sake. Everybody has a gun in Idaho. And um, and the battery charge came when he when he had been locked out. He went in there one day and to talk to her. And uh, she went to throw, this is what I've heard, she went to throw a phone at him and he grabbed her wrist. And so being an attorney, she charged him with battery because he touched her. He never hit her. He's never hit a woman that I'm aware of. Um, and I think that he figured since she was an attorney, he'd been in two child custody cases. He couldn't afford to find an attorney in court. And I think he just said, you know what, mom, I, I and then, you know, I'll just move on. He's like, I think I'm going to start a limousine company. And I think he just, I think it was a turning point in his life where too many bad things had happened with his fiance dying, the, the, the child custody case for his daughter, um, the second custody case, the business being taken. I think he was feeling very defeated. And I think I, maybe he was associating with people that were not his normal friends. And I and no, he did not plan to see her that I knew of. And, and knowing that and, and and to your knowledge, no uh no lawyer's name or anything has ever popped up since two thousand four that Aaron had gone to talk to one or had given it any um, a retainer fee for possible suing her, anything like that. Only, only the bankruptcy. I think that was consuming him. Is the bankruptcy? He needed to find a way to make money. They took all of his tools. They kept, um, you know, anything that he had of value that he could sell to make ends meet. Uh, Constance kept. Not only that, you know, I don't even know if she knows this, but uh, my son had a sear, and it's a metal piece that makes uh, a gun automatic, and. Um, he had that, and the last time we'd seen it, it was um, sitting on his equipment, and it's worth ten thousand dollars. I have the official paperwork for it. Yeah. Ben could have sold that, and she she took it, which is illegal for her to have. Yeah, it's very. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, of course, in the United States and most states, um, people are allowed to own a lot of different kinds of guns, but automatic weapons and what that's what you're talking about uh, are illegal for most citizens to own you have to go through yes, quite a you have to jump through a lot of hoops to be able to own one what, yes as far as i'm concerned she stole that it's a ten thousand dollar piece i have the original signed um document for that piece and it ended up in her hands whether she knows it or not i don't know Uh, what is uh, Constance's last name? And she has a little bit of a colorful lawyer history that the, the listeners can look up um, going back to the 1990s, well before she met Aaron. Uh, what is her last name? And um, do, give uh, her full name, and then I want to ask you a couple questions, if you could. Uh, her name is Constance Norris Malman. And um, so sometimes she's gone by Constance Norris and sometimes Constance Malman. One of them is um, probably a maiden name and one a married name. I'm not sure. So I don't know if she took Malman back or from married, if it's her married name or if she took it back as her, as her maiden name. I don't know, but it's Constance Norris Malman, M-A-L-M-I-N. Have you ever had a chance to talk to Constance one-on-one? 
Yes, I told her um, that she needed to drop that um, bogus battery charge because people are not interested in looking for a man who the police said carries a gun and has a battery charge against him from the get-go. And uh, and she said she would do that. So I, in my mind, that was her admitting that it was bogus. But And did she uh, do that? And did she do that? Well, she said she called, but once it's in the hands of the prosecutor, it was up to them, and they never, ever would return a phone call. So as far as I know, it's still out there. But here's the thing, too. My son fought for his children hardly, and in the last custody case, he represented himself pro se. He was very... uh, he would he would have fought that even if it had been a valid battery charge, which in my mind it was not anything close to valid, other than the fact that he did touch somebody. Uh, he would have fought that because at the very most it's a five hundred dollar charge, a fee, five hundred dollar fee. It's a misdemeanor and a five hundred dollar fee. He would have fought that, but it made, it angered me, and so um, he didn't show up for the court case because. He was missing. When you got to talk to Constance, did she ever offer you uh, any sort of theory as to what happened to Aaron? No. I don't even know that I asked her. I was just one purpose was to get her to drop that battery charge so that the newspaper wouldn't have it look so negative. And I was angry that, that, um, that she had done something so vindictive after she had stolen the business in my mind, still in the business. Well, I guess given the situation, um, maybe she's not going to feel too bad that Aaron disappeared, but she showed no sympathy toward you, never offered up a theory, never said, you know what, I think Aaron was having problems with this person, that person, or she even said, well, maybe he ran off to Mexico. No, and I think it's also very strange. Again, nothing illegal, but very strange human nature in that, um, Clayton Peterson, the mechanic, uh, Aaron had hired him. Uh, he is a gifted mechanic, I believe, on bicycles, very knowledgeable, not particularly. Um, Do you mean motorcycles? Yes, motorcycles. Okay. And not particularly eloquent or uh, well-read or anything, which doesn't mean anything bad, but he's, he's not educated, um, so he talks like he's so really. Um, may or may not be a nice person. I don't know. He has a gifted mechanic. I'll give him that. But Constance, after she sold the motorcycle shop um, to uh, to uh, Clayton and Richard Harris, all of a sudden Clayton, now in her annual filing for her lawship, for her lawyership, for her law firm, Mm -hmm. is now uh, her corporate secretary. It's not illegal. It's not wrong. But why in the world, when you have all kinds of people, relatives and friends and whatever, would you have a bike mechanic as your corporate secretary? It could be because they were really good friends. I I don't know. Or maybe you keep your enemies close. I don't know. Or your people. I don't know. It's just very odd to me. So he went from... Being a motorcycle mechan- uh, mechanic, he gets hired on um, by Aaron and Constance, I guess, to f- work on these motorcycles while they have the shop. And then before he know, is, knows that he's the, the secretary on the corporate papers for a law for- firm. Yes, and the owner of the shop. And we have to remind the listeners that Clayton and Tyler are friends. Tyler's the yeah. roommate. Best friends. Best they friends. were at the time. At and, the time, at, at the time, and do you think that Aaron found Clayton through Tyler, or is it just a coincidence that Tyler and Clayton were friends, and Aaron just happened to hire Clayton to be the motorcycle mechanic? I I don't know if Aaron met Tyler through Clayton, but I think um, I know that Aaron told me that he was uh, had moved a, a friend of his. His name is John. Out of his house, um, who had just moved in like a couple of weeks before, he'd asked John to move out. He said, um, I have this other guy that's going to um, move in. I 
I'm doing this as a favor to a friend, and I'm really sorry about it, but I need to have you move in here. I guess what I'm saying here is that this motorcycle shop, it existed and then fell apart before Tyler became Aaron's roommate, right? Because Ty- Tyler was not the roommate for Aaron for too long, so... You're maybe right. maybe asking. Aaron yeah. maybe Aaron ran into Tyler through Clayton maybe back in 2002 could have been something like that could be yeah could have been and you're right because the bicycle shop um, or the motorcycle shop uh, had already been uh, taken and then uh, Aaron disappeared in December so right. yes yeah you're right okay just just wanted to make sure I was clear on that um so we have. Uh, Tyler, we have Constance, we have Clayton, who, um, is there any chance that Clayton and Constance maybe had or are still having a, some sort of romantic relationship? Maybe that could be the reason he's on her corporate papers? Maybe. maybe. I don't know. You don't know. I don't right. know. I don't know. Let's talk about somebody else. You uh, mentioned him just in passing very early in this conversation. I realize for the listeners, this is a Long interview, but this is all very relevant to Aaron's disappearance. What can you tell the listeners about a guy? His name is Andy. Now, he was friends with Tyler, and actually Aaron had known him since they were kids, but he may play some sort of role in all of this. Andy, uh, his name is Andrew Tucker, Andy Tucker. And Andy and Aaron knew each other in grade school. They were about 10 years old. Andy was in my Cub Scout troop when I was a den mother. And I don't know if they saw each other. I don't think they saw each other much through school after that. And uh, Aaron had run into him because he called and said, Mom, you'll never guess who I ran into today. Do you remember Andy Tucker? And I didn't. And then I pulled out pictures of the um, Cub Scout meetings and, and when Aaron had come to visit, and he said, yeah, that's Andy. So uh, Andy had been in Cub Scouts with him and they ran into each other and Andy doesn't have a normal job. Like, you know, he doesn't work for somebody, but he runs a poker house. Aaron and Andy got into some sort of business arrangement, didn't they regarding a a poker game that Andy wanted to run? Yes. Andy ran a, a poker games, high stake poker games. And, um, Aaron didn't play poker, but he thought, you know, I've got this three bedroom, two back house. And then he built on, he had just built on a garden room on the back that was all windows. And he put a little um, electric fireplace in there to make it cozy. And Aaron decided that he was going to buy a professional poker table and um, put it out there. And he I talked to Andy about rather than meeting in these dismal house or an ugly old house. He said, why don't you bring your high stakes, wealthy poker players to my house, use the garden room and I will cater and I'll charge you. I don't know how much it was a night, you know, $300 a night or something. And that was a, a source for a bench to make, have some income and have nothing to do with playing the poker, but certainly uh, using the house. Um, I didn't like it, but you know, He's an adult, so uh, and he kept saying, "Mom, I'm not into the poker part of it. I'm just into the uh, logistics of the rental house rental." And Andy was there, and I'm wondering if maybe that's why Tyler moved in as a security guard or something. I don't know, but they had a number of games. Really, people didn't show up. It was sort of a bust. It ended up um, Ben got rid of their poker table and and didn't do that anymore. So it only lasted, I don't know, probably a month or less. Uh, but that's how he met Andy, and they uh, became friends. And um, Andy, uh, I don't know much about Andy. Um, Let's put, let me ask you this. When, let me ask you this. Well, how, how long before Aaron's disappearance did that happen? Well, it was after the bike shop had t- been taken away. Aaron was looking for another source of income. So uh, it was probably um, a couple of months, several months uh, before. So sometime, let's yeah, say in 2004, was- that this poker 
game uh, idea came up and then fell apart. Yeah, yeah. I would say it was in the summer or fall. It was sometime in there before I disappeared, late summer or fall. And Andy was one also that um, I don't know what his um, knowledge or participation in any of this is, except for the fact that he was gone for a couple of months in California and Las Vegas. During that time, Aaron had collected some poker debts for him and and mailed the money to him. And I think that's what he was probably living off of. When he came back to town, he was asking everybody where Aaron was. And then he was uh, spreading the story that Aaron had gone to Mexico and was hiding out, whatever that means. The police, I told the police, the police looked into it. There's no record of any entry or exit in and out of Mexico for Aaron. Um, I don't know. So uh, Aaron was doing some collecting for Andy? Yeah. Yeah. So when we talked about it, my, my son told me everything. And I remember saying, you, you're a collector. I, I said, are you getting into knee breaking or something? I was just serious. And he said, no, mom. He said, you know me better than that. I don't fight. I don't hurt people. He said, I just go by. These are people that know Andy that come to the games. They need credit. He'll extend credit to them. And then they need to get the money to Andy. I just go pick it up and send it to Andy. He said, I've had no problem at all. No resistance. Nothing like that. I just am doing the errand for Andy. That's what he told me, but, you know, I'm his mother, so... But I know that Ben, uh, or Aaron, was not violent, so I tended to believe that. So it sounds like Andy might have been a loan shark. I don't know. It's something. That's that's what it's... That's kind of what it sounds like. He's giving money out to people, yeah. and then that sounds a little bit like a loan shark for people who can't get uh, loans the real way. Well, um, and Aaron, Aaron, Aaron like, does seem like an unlikely person to go collect uh, debts like that. Yeah, and and Andy has a very dark side because um, after Aaron had uh, disappeared for some time, um, Andy was arrested um, for a violent home invasion in Ontario, Oregon. Uh, he and a lady and another man broke into an elderly woman's home, beat her up, and they were caught. Andy served, I think he got six years in prison. I don't know if he served the whole six years, but he was right. serving time in an Oregon facility. Oh, my. And he's out now, so I don't know where he is. And do you know where he was at the time of Aaron's disappearance? Was he even in Boise or the state of Idaho at the time Aaron disappeared? I supposedly he was out of state. It is interesting, though. When he came back, um, he got very friendly with Janelle, who had become afraid of Tyler. And when friends would call her to talk to her, he wouldn't let them talk to her her uh, and not about Aaron I don't know maybe that upset her or something but he would get furious to have the phone hanging up that's what well, I was she told. was working she was working for him or something wasn't she no she went after uh, she and Tyler after she became afraid of Tyler would not take his calls anymore this is after the watch and all she went to work for Andy's best friend. Um, oh, Andy's best friend. Okay. A guy in Nampa. And then when Andy came back to town, then he um, contacted her. And she didn't know him. So this is all very strange. We always felt that maybe Janelle was being controlled, but we don't know that. It just was odd human behavior. Because it wasn't anything illegal, just odd. And uh, you have, in going back to the poker uh, game idea, you have a belief that the reason that Tyler ended up being Aaron's roommate, and we have to remind everybody that the re, you know, Aaron ended up kicking out a good friend of his, John, so Tyler could be the roommate. It might have all been instigated by Andy. Possibly, yes. 
there was something about why he would want to move Tyler in and move John out. It had something to do, I think, with the poker games, and maybe, maybe Tyler was supposed to be the security guard or something. He was. He's very muscly now, but he had, you know, I don't know. Did you, uh, do, to your knowledge, have the police ever talked to Andy about Aaron's disappearance? I can't imagine that they didn't, but I don't have any notes about them talking to Andy. All right, not to your knowledge. It would make, what you're saying is it might make sense, but you just don't know if they've ever talked to him. Right. I don't know everything that they did. I know an awful lot about what the police did because so much of it came from me in the first place. Because during the first seven months, they wouldn't do anything. So I did it, and um, a private detective did And then I eventually turned all those notes over to the police. And then they did investigate it. But in the beginning, they didn't. So I don't know. I know a lot about this case because of my own investigation initially. Yeah. But I don't know everything that the police did. Although they've been quite open with me, I don't know everything. What I'm telling you is the stuff that I need to my own of course. source. Of course. So we have, we now have Tyler, the roommate. We have Constance, the ex-business partner, ex-girlfriend. Um, and we should note for the record, we didn't, maybe, maybe we talked about this before. Constance, quite a bit older than Aaron was. Uh, we have Andy, a friend from childhood that um, became a criminal on his own, breaking into somebody's house in Oregon, going to jail for a while. We now come to another ex-business owner of Aaron's, and this would have been before the motorcycle uh, shop, and this would have been the pawn shop owner. Uh, it wasn't just a pawn shop owner. Aaron was going to do something involving guns with this guy as well, but this guy said some things after Aaron disappeared. What can you tell the listeners about that? Um, yes, and Ben Benj ended up working at this pawn store. It was it was a nice um, pawn shop, but... Um, you know, sort of a retail store, for, I guess you could say, too, because they had so many tools and jewelry and stuff like, like most of them do, quite a large one. He worked there for quite a while, became manager, and uh, had a good relationship with uh, Roy Rice. His name is Eugene Roy Rice. And um, this is where Aaron learned a lot about guns. He had a, a great mind, and when he learned about whether it was keyboards or guitars um, or cars, you know, he, he just had this near photographic memory, and so he learned a lot about guns. And in, initially, when he was fighting for custody of his daughter, he um, would go to gun shows, and that's how he got out of the pawn business and started his own gun business because he needed to work weekends, not during the week, so that he could see his daughter, whose visitation days changed all the time. So Roy Rice and Aaron um, were fairly close, and when Aaron had bro broken away from the pawn shop and started his own uh, gun business, he developed, designed and developed a, a rifle. And it was uh, at the time, this was, you know, years ago, at the time it was uh, unique in that it was, a, it was a 50 caliber rifle and most of those at the time were like four feet long, maybe longer, five feet long. And they, and they hooked onto the side of jeeps, you know, for the military because they were so huge and so heavy. Well, Aaron's was only um, 30 or 34 inches long. And it was a single shot. It had the recoil of a 20-gauge shotgun and uh, extremely accurate. So it was a lightweight, and there were actually two foreign countries that were interested in this. It was uh, it had a, a possible future, but to manufacture guns takes a lot of licensing, a lot of money, and Aaron didn't have it. So he went to Roy and said, do you want to help develop this gun at all? They went to Mexico and looked at an area where they might manufacture this. Um, Roy put up $100,000, and with that money, Aaron had a lot of drawings, technical drawings done. He had uh, some Kevlar molds being made. He had parts being manufactured. And, um, and after some time, it was going very slow, and it became clear you didn't need a lot of money to start a company like this. 
And eventually, Aaron just got tired of the whole gun business and um, got out. Plus, uh, there's more to the story I can talk to you about later. But um, so he wrote a letter, which I have a copy of, that he sent to Roy Rice and the third partner, uh, Thomas Henry. Thomas Henry was an attorney in Boise who uh, made a mistake and uh, I believe he was disbarred for accepting drugs in chart instead of money. Um, whatever he did, he did something wrong and was disbarred. But he works at a law firm as a um, researcher, paralegal, whatever his title is, and has been working there for a while. He worked in the law firm that was Roy Rice's law firm. And so Thomas Henry, Roy Rice, and Aaron Barnard formed this company. I think it was RAT Enterprises or something like that. And Ben wanted out. So he wrote him this letter and said, I can sell you my portion of the business or we can dissolve the business. We can sell the assets and split them proportionately. He had like four options that they could do. And Roy was furious because it hadn't gotten off the ground. They'd made some of the guns, prototypes, but it hadn't gotten off the ground. And um, and that was four years before Benj disappeared. So I never really considered that he was um, a person of interest because four years had passed. Mm. He sold the pawn shop. And um, then after Benj had disappeared and had been gone for some time, all of a sudden, Roy Rice was bragging to people that he had him uh, murdered. Um, he contacted his uh, friend in prison, Jerry Frizzell, and had asked uh, Mr. Frizzell to contact a biker gang and have Aaron killed. When the police talked to him, he denied that. So I don't know if um, hmm. if uh, it, I, I don't know what the truth is there because he was bragging about it, and then he was told no. It's interesting too that when um, Roy Rice and his attorney had a falling out. In the deposition for some other totally non-related situation. Having nothing, no, some, something else that had nothing to do with Aaron. Nothing to do with Aaron. It was a falling out between the attorney and Roy Rice. And in the deposition of Roy, the the question came up of, do you know anything about Aaron Barnard's disappearance? So they're doing this deposition on something that doesn't have to have anything to do with Aaron's Aaron's disappearance, but it came up anyway. What happened? Uh, what I heard was that the again, you're right. The deposition had something to do with with um, Roy Rice's attorney. Mr. Salaz and Roy Rice it had nothing to do with Aaron. It was something about his business and totally related to Aaron. But one of the questions asked in the deposition, I've been told, was, do you know anything about the disappearance of Aaron Barnett? Now, why they would ask that of Roy Rice during the deposition or something totally unrelated was very bizarre to me. I don't that was a, um, a warning, a message, trying to get him shaken. I don't know what that was about, but it was very odd. And what was the answer? Did, what, did the conversation ever go anywhere from there? I was not able to get my hands on the deposition, so I don't know. Mm. I will admit, I will, I will say this too, which is very interesting. I did receive an anonymous um, letter. Very okay. kind-hearted person, and I just, if they're listening to this, I wanted to know I, I I thank them for that. But the um, letter said that Thomas Henry, the third partner, knows what happened to him. Now, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but the anonymous letter said he does. The police interviewed him. He was very um, willing to talk to them and said, no, he doesn't know what happened. So, again, either he doesn't know or he's just not talking. I don't know. Uh, how long after Aaron disappeared did you get this letter? Approximation. Uh, 
it, well, um, it was after it, probably, it had to be at least six months. So I would say the between the middle to the end of two thousand five. Okay, and was that letter typed or written, handwritten? It was typed. Typed. Uh, and where was it postmarked from? Do you, do you, um. Where was it postmarked it was post- from? What was it postmarked from uh, in Idaho? Um, yes, Boise, Idaho. Okay. And do you have that letter? I have a copy of the letter. I did. Um, I was very torn of whether to turn the letter over or not because uh, obviously the person wanted to be anonymous, and I was so grateful for someone sharing what they knew. But I did turn it over to the police with the understanding that if they were able to find out who this was, that they would not be um, uh, pointed out or involved if they chose to remain anonymous. Do you, to and this we, day, we do you, not, and you don't, and you don't have to tell if you don't have to say. Do you have any idea who might have sent you that letter? I, I have no idea, nor do the police. But we appreciate it. I wish they'd send another one with more information. Okay. Do you think that there's any chance that Thomas Henry, who once uh, is a disgraced lawyer, was a lawyer, lost his license? Is there any reason to believe that uh, he might know what has happened to Aaron just be through his lawyer circles, being that Constance is a lawyer in Boise as well? And do the, is it possible that, that Thomas Henry... And Constance might have known each other. It, possibly because Boise isn't that large and mm-hmm. they're both attorney, or he was an attorney, he worked mm-hmm. for a law firm. That could be, I think it's more likely that if Thomas knows anything, um, that it's because of Roy Rice and his boss, who is Denny Salaz. Denny was, uh, Salaz was Roy Rice's attorney and they had the falling out. And the deposition had to do do with something between Salaz and Rice. And it could be that. And then also uh, Thomas Henry was the third partner. Yeah. So he obviously had discussions with Roy Rice about the dissolution, dissolution of the company, the gun company. Yeah. So I think he may know that. And it could have been that Roy Rice was bragging to, to Thomas Henry that, well, I'm going to have the guy killed. I don't know. But Thomas Henry did uh, willingly talk to the police when they, uh, he didn't come to court on his own, but they did go talk to him and we learned nothing more than what we already knew. Have you ever personally talked to Thomas Henry one-on-one? I have called him a couple of times and he, uh, uh, he hasn't answered. So um, I'm looking forward to talking to him someday face to face. Okay. All right. So we have the, the uh, pawn shop owner who, uh, might have wanted revenge. Uh, and did you tell me the pawn shop owner? He's not alive anymore, is he? No, he uh, is deceased. Uh, we did hear from uh, a person I don't know their name who knew him well and said that you know he also had a lot of excavation equipment on his uh, property. I, I just don't know. You know, there's so many ways this case can go. I, I've always just brought it back home to who told the most lies and who was the closest because it just it, it just keeps going on and on and on. Um, but he is deceased now, and I am very upset about that because he was older, and if you're going to brag about having someone killed, I think you should, you know, be forced to tell more about that. But he denied that when the police talked to him. He laughed about it and denied it. Would you say what you've learned about this guy, does he have like a shady history or anything like that? Do you think he might be capable of that? Or do you think it was, you think it was just what it was? Maybe him just making a joke or something, a horrible joke, but a joke nonetheless. I don't know. I'll tell you just my thoughts on it is he's an older man. He has a ton of money. Um, so he lost some money in this. He could have taken up the gun company and gone ahead and developed it and become a millionaire. So it wasn't that Aaron wasn't off- offering him all of the research and everything. Um, he was just mad that he didn't get off the ground, I think, and that his money was spent. But but his money still had molds and prototypes and drawings and, and uh, schematics and all. So it wasn't like he didn't get anything for it. So I, I think he was... 
mad, but that was four years prior to Aaron's disappearance. Unless he just was harboring a, a huge grudge, I find that story the least likely to believe. Okay, so we now have four different people, maybe might have had some grudges against Aaron in one way or another, just uh, some, some characters. We have to come back, it seems like we have to always come back to the issue of guns and this floor say for this hidden area in Aaron's house. What can you tell the listeners about this? Uh, and this happened well after Tyler moved out. Uh, what happened there? Well, I'd been to, been to disappeared. I went to Boise. We waited a week because, uh, you know, what we had said, it, it just, we shouldn't have that. It was a week before he was uh, reported. And uh, I went over there, stayed for two weeks, packed up his house, um, I came back to work and could not concentrate at all. I was just a basket case. So I went back to Boise and um, researched with my private investigator everything we could. And eventually, being um, a single person, I, I needed to go back to work. And one day, uh, I'd been back a week or so. So this would be about a month or five weeks after Aaron had disappeared, uh, this friend of his, his name is Daniel Whitaker. Daniel was Aaron's best friend's nephew. Uh, the nephew had been raised by the best friend's parents, so his grandparents. And uh, Aaron would ask him to do odd jobs for him, um, help him move things, load the van, you know, before a show, things like that to give him some spending money. And he always called Daniel the little thief. That was his nickname for him. And Daniel, of course, says he's never stolen anything in his life, but um, that was always been his nickname for him. Daniel called me one day and said, Vicki, did anyone look under the house in the crawl space? And I said, we looked for the crawl space. I know it was in the closet, but we pulled on the carpet everywhere we could, and we couldn't find a seam or a handle, and we couldn't pull the carpet. Nothing would move, so we don't know where it is. He said, well, I had this dream that Aaron was under the house. And it upset me very much, he said. Mm. And I said, well, you know, we never looked because we couldn't find the crawl space. Tell you what, I will fly over to Boise and we'll go look. I said, I can't leave until day before tomorrow, day after tomorrow. So I'll be there in, you know, two days or three days. And I took time off work again to fly over to Boise. And I said, I will call you when I get there and let's meet at the house. He said, okay. And then I made the mistake of saying, you know, now that you mentioned it, Daniel, when Aaron was a teenager, he put a box of books under in the crawl space. And there weren't anything wrong. It's just that he, you know, he needed more room in his bedroom because he had so many guitars and stuff. But he, and he put some um, a box of books down there. And I thought I would never have thought of storing something down there. And then, to make the story more interesting, I talked to Yvette, and she said, Well, you know, Vicki, Aaron thought Tyler was stealing from him. He was going to ask him to move out. And he said, I've got some things. I don't know what to do with them. And so they had a discussion, and Aaron had rented a storage unit off-site uh, to store some of his more valuable things. And she said, my husband and I always put a safe up in his attic, but if you don't have an attic, because Aaron's house was a man's roof house, there was no attic, she said, I suggest we put things in the crawl space. So then I thought, oh, my God, maybe there." Maybe there is something to this. So uh, I made the mistake of telling that to Daniel. Um, and so three days later, I'm in Boise, Idaho. I called Daniel and said, Daniel, I've landed. I'm here. Let's meet at the house. And he said, oh, you know, I don't think I want to. I said, wait a minute. I just spent, you know, $250 on the airplane ticket, rented a car. I'm here in town because you wanted to look under the house. You had this terrible dream. Well, I'm with my girlfriend now. I just don't want to come. I was furious. So I went to the house on my own and found that it had been broken into. It scared me. 
and uh, the sliding glass doors were left ajar, not all the way, but like six inches. It was, remember, uh, cold. The back bedroom, which was his little boy's bedroom, the window had been smashed. And when I called the police, I was afraid to go in the house by myself. So um, I called Daniel. I said, Daniel, the house has been broken into. Did you do this? And he goes, I don't know anything about that. So I, so I hung up. And when we went into the house, um, I called um, my private investigator because I was afraid. And they came and met me, and we waited for the police to show up. They'd had an accident, and so it took a while. So we looked all around the house and stepped outside while we waited for them. And then when they finally came, we went in the house. Remember, the house had all been vacuumed and cleaned. It was totally yeah, empty of that. everything. Yeah. Right. In the bedroom, the master bedroom, um, the, the crawl space lid had been pulled up. Oh, I forgot to mention that I called Robert, Benji's best friend. I said, Robert, you lived here for a couple of years. Do you know where the crawl space is? I know it's in the bedroom. He said, yes, it's by the water heater in the closet. And I said, but I pulled up and I couldn't get it. He said, there's a trick to it. You have to pull up at an angle and then slide it out and lift it because part of it is under the water heater. And until you slide it, it won't come up. And I said, oh, my God. His bre- his nephew had also called Robert and asked where it was, and Robert told him. So then, so I'm sorry I skipped back there, but uh, Daniel knew where the cross face was. I knew where the cross face was, but we now, and Robert knew where it was. Other than that, we had had a hard time finding it. So when the police got there, we went inside, and everything was clean, but the cross space um, what do you call it, door uh, hatch was in the middle of the room, upside down, and it had been all left open. And then there was an orange tag left on the floor. I knew what that was immediately, but I called Daniel's grandfather and I said, the police have been here, they fingerprinted, They've looked all around. They went under the house, the crawl space. There was nothing there. However, with the story of the dream and knowing where the crawl space was, they believe Daniel most likely broke into the house. And he said, well, he did not. I said, do you know that? And he said, I said, the doors were left open. He said, I did that. I said, you left the, the sliding glass door, and that was at the front of the house. There was a front door, and then there were sliding glass doors into the living room there. And I said, why would you, in this cold weather, leave the door open? And he said, I don't know. And I said, and also there was an orange, a fluorescent orange tag on the floor. He said, oh, that was probably, I went and bought a flashlight. It was probably the price tag on my flashlight, which, of course, it wasn't. And um, I called Daniel, and he I told the grandfather, and then at three in the morning, I got a phone call at my hotel room from Daniel screaming at me that how dare I accuse him of breaking in, and I I didn't know, so I was nice to Daniel. I said, Daniel, I don't know that you did that, but I told your grandfather that the police think you did, and you have to admit, it's very odd that you wanted me to come over there, you were desperate for me to come over there, you asked uh, Robert where the call space was, and then I get there, and you won't come, plus the house has been broken into. So I get this feeling, if I if I may, if I may, Vicky, I I get this feeling that since once Aaron disappeared, it was like, um, and I don't mean to be lighthearted about this, but it was like a going out of business sale. That anything in Aaron's house was like for anybody to take. Tyler takes the furniture, at least. You know, uh, this Jason Coley guy ends up with the watch and the gun. Um, and then there was something in the crawl space. We suspect it might be guns. There might've been money. There's somebody else, even a family member, a, a relation of Aaron's coming over there. It's, you know, it's really bizarre. It's very bizarre. And, and to that point, uh, his best friend, Robert and his father, who is now deceased, but they both took uh, computer monitors and I said, you guys, we can't start getting rid of Aaron's things. I put everything in storage. I'm not taking it. And you can't take his things either because he might be coming back tomorrow. We don't know that anything's happened to him. And they would not, no matter how hard I pushed, return those. And I finally said, well, I can either call the cops or I'm going to make you sign right here. And this was his best friend. So I didn't want to, 
you know, make things horrible. And so I said, fine, right here in my notebook, I want you both to sign that you took these monitors without approval. And they both signed that. But they took them. And it's like, they must have known he wasn't coming back to, or they suspected it. And it it just, I, I know that Aaron always had a gun collection. And I think that he thought Tyler was stealing from him. And the gun collection was not in the storage space that he rented. So I believe they were under the house in plastic. And I also never found the seven or $11,000 that Aaron had that he had was readily keeping to buy the limousine that I was searching for him in Portland. He was also looking in other cities for a limousine to start a limousine company to just pay the bills until he found some other new company that he wanted to start or a job or whatever, however he was going to make an in, income. So the money was never found. Um, I know that why Bet had given back a set of pearls that Erin had uh, given her, and she said, no, she couldn't take that. You know, they were too too special. And so he had those. He was also collecting, he had a couple of rare coins or collectible coins. And he was also collecting quarters for Yvette's daughters because they were, uh, um, especially Cassie, the younger one, was collecting them all the state quarters. All those 50 st- out. yeah, right, when they did that, yeah. yeah. And none of those were found anywhere. So I think that the uh, money box that I had given Aaron was probably where he was keeping those things. When I had been there to visit him, it had been on his headboard. And it was not there anymore. And I'm thinking that that was probably the little in the house as well. But that's just a guess. And I called um, Daniel just about a month ago. And he now owns a moving company in Boise. And I asked him about it, and he denies it you know, with his last breath, that he did not do anything. But I think his story is just, you know, uh-huh. ripe with holes. I'd like to know um, if he gave his... Um, did Tyler know where this crawl space was? I don't know. But I do know this about about everybody wanting Aaron's things. Aaron liked collecting. He's like me. My whole house is, is uh, furnished with uh, yard sale things or goodwill things, items, and I like nice things, and so did Aaron. Um, And he would barter or find things at garage sales and stuff. And for his age, most of his friends were still working minimum wage jobs and and, uh, maybe had a rental bench, had a three-bedroom, two-bath house that was nicely furnished. I mean, it wasn't elegant and expensive, but it was nicely done. And um, everybody seemed to want his Stuff. And when he got the storage unit, because Tyler was stealing from him, the last thing Aaron is going to do is put the little lime green, bright as you can be, security combination to the left to the storage unit on the top of his desk. And when people were there initially, like that and Robert, there was that wasn't there. But when they came back later and found the credit card and driver's license. On top of all his paperwork also was the combination to the security unit. We tried to get the tape of people who had entered, but they only record over it every 30 days, so it wasn't a family. And what was in that security unit? Where was it? It was a lot of, um, he had some, um, um, was he had a couple of uh, big black boxes of uh, one was a, a fake and one was supposedly real. I've not had that looked at, but um, uh, what do you call the um, Japanese warriors? Uh, samurai. Samurai, yeah, samurai helmet and oh, helmet. yeah, samurai helmet and uh, and for back, lack of a better word, uniform, sort of. Okay. Um, he liked Japanese stuff, and so those were uh, one of them. These was valuable that he collected. Well, do you believe that anything was stolen from that security unit? Being that the the combination is right there, do you believe anything was stolen out of that security unit? I have I have no idea of knowing because I don't know what was in there. I only know what I got out and put in with the unit when I I, I combined units when I put his house when I cleaned out his house and put it all in storage in the hopes he was coming back, I took out stuff in that little unit and put it in the 
big unit, but I had movers doing that, so I don't know what was in there. All right. Uh, one more thing. Being that uh, Aaron had his uh, license to deal guns, uh, all gun dealers have to keep a book of the guns that they have in stock and everything. Was that book ever found with the guns that might have been in Aaron's possession when he disappeared? When Aaron was in the gun business, he did take, take the records, but he turned in his FFL, um, his federal firearms license. And there was a, a rumor I heard um, when he disappeared that he might have gone into the witness relocation program because he testified against this guy that was making manufacturing pieces for the 50 caliber. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in Utah, and he was numbering things wrong, and Aaron discovered it. and. Um, testified against him, he went to prison. So he was in prison at the time Aaron disappeared, however. Uh, there was a... Um, it would, let's, just, uh, let's just try to keep to that. that to the, we'll get to that in a second. Specifically, was did Aaron key, ever keep a book of the, the guns that he sold or was in his possession? Would he have had something like that when he disappeared? Would that have been in his possession would that have been in the the, the security unit? Would it have been in the crawl space? Uh, anything like that? It, it could have been in the crawl space. It never showed up. I thought he probably turned that into the um, the ATF when he gave up his gun store. I'm not sure. And it's, if you're in Idaho at the time, if you were selling guns, like at a gun show, you know, if you were licensed, you had to have a three day wait or whatever. But if you were just going to a gun show and selling your own guns, you did not have to do the background check. So I don't know that he kept that sort of information on his personal guns or not. As far as the Gun Monkey retail stores books, I think those were turned into the BATF. Well, the reason I'm asking is that there'd be a very good way to cover up the theft of guns. To also, If Aaron still did have his book, the way, a good way to cover that up would be not just to take those guns that might have been in the crawl space with this money, whatever else might have been in there, but also take the book too. Yes. That's, that's, and, why, and that's why I'm guns. asking that. And I had the serial number on a couple of his guns, and I knew what one of them was, the tag that was found in the on the floor. That mm -hmm. was a gun, and it's not one that you hear about a lot. So I told all of this to the police, and for, I don't know if they're still doing it, but for years they were tracking anybody that would pawn or sell that model of gun would be, um, you know, a light would go off. And uh, that's a good point. I need to check to see that they're still doing that. But I think if the guns were stolen, they were all handled privately and under the table or something because um, any of them that we had the numbers on or the name of that rare one, it, nothing ever came up. Now, we're going to talk about a court case uh, that Aaron was involved in. Now, we haven't mentioned another court case yet. Aaron was actually involved in another court case, and we're going to talk about that entire disappearance case next week. The, Aaron was yeah. just on the tangent, you know, on the fringes involved in that case. But this is a different case, and it had to do with Aaron's a work with guns. Why don't you tell the listeners about that? Because he testified against somebody who ended up going to jail. And in both cases, he made a decision on the, on the right side to do the right mm -hmm. thing. I think so. Uh, he wasn't perfect, but he did have a sense of right and wrong. And, um, this case, I don't know a lot about this case. Um, I know that when Aaron owned his gun store, it was called the gun monkey. In, on Shinton Boulevard in Boise. He sold a lot of uh, guns to individuals, but a lot to the police as well and to law enforcement. And he was manufacturing or, or de designing the 50 caliber that we talked about earlier. And one of the people that was making, I believe it was barrels for the gun, and they were a special barrel made to spec. And the name of the man that was supposed to be making these was Wayne Budo. He lived in Utah, metropolitan Salt Lake area. I don't know if it was a outer city or not, but Wayne Barbudo. And Wayne was, as I recall, was numbering them wrong. Ben had a hard time. He paid him in advance and could never get the product. 
I think he waited like nine or ten months and was always after this guy who um, always had an excuse why he couldn't get to it. Um, and there's another part to this I have to say first. Um, Aaron was very knowledgeable about guns, but he was um, very, very, um, what's the word? concerned about doing all the paperwork right because he was a great salesperson but he was not great at paperwork and whenever he would come to Portland to a gun show he would do a tremendous volume and he would stay up half the night doing all the paperwork I say you need to get some sleep you say mom it's the BATF I have to report all this I don't want to make any mistakes I'm going to do it while it's fresh in my mind and even when I was in Boise in his shop one time he called the BATF and he said, I have a gun here. It's an assault rifle. And I know the difference between the post ban and the pre ban normally. But this gun, he said, I can't tell if it's pre ban or post ban. It's got this part on it and this number on it and whatever. And he said, I just can't tell. Can you help me? And they said, no. And so he said, okay, I'm going to break it apart. So he said, Mom, if I break this gun apart, and he did it in front of me, he said, um, it, it, then it's not illegal to have it. But if it's put together and it's a pre ban gun, or I don't really know all the difference here, but he said, you know, it's something that is illegal to sell. And I don't know if he turned around and sold it, made a decision without the BATF's help because they wouldn't help him, made the decision that it was a, a pre ban gun and he could sell it or what. But um, the rumor that went around town that I heard from people was that he got in trouble for selling a pre ban gun as a post ban gun. And that maybe is the truth. Maybe he made a mistake there. I know that he was concerned about it, though. So I don't think it's anything he would have done on purpose. But, you know, I, don't, I can't speak for him. He's gone. So anyway, I think that the BATF used that. And that may be how they got him to testify. Um, but they put pressure on him to testify against Wayne Bar Barbudo. And I know that Aaron was nervous. I don't think he was feeling bad about testifying against him. I think he was nervous because it was a federal case he'd, and he'd never been in court before. Um, but it made him nervous. And then he voluntarily gave up his um, federal firearms license. And that's when he then eventually got into the um, sport bike. Motor motorcycles. I'm sorry. He was never arrested. He was never in trouble. But I think there was some forced uh, force put on him to uh, relinquish his firearms license. And how long did this uh, other guy go to jail for? Uh, yeah, multiple years. He was released June 28th of 05. So, so I would say he got a couple of years. All right. So he went into jail and he was in jail when Aaron disappeared. But maybe this guy might, you know, I bring this up. The listeners can judge it for themselves. Could this guy have wanted a little revenge on Aaron for, you know, testifying against him that sent him to jail? You know, Aaron gets off scot-free except for having to give up his license. Maybe he did that voluntarily. Um, Aaron's continuing to live his life, getting into the motorcycle business. Motorcycle business. Maybe this guy going to jail feels Aaron should have gone to jail as well. Maybe there's some sort of uh, revenge factor there. That's why I'm asking you about this. Absolutely, there could be. I am open to, I mean, this is so complicated. I am always open to any possibility. However, I'm not sure that this guy is a um, psychotic or what do you call the path, uh, pathological uh, person. I think he's external, uh, unlike others that we know of that are more out of control. I, I don't know. All right. Well, uh, the reason I bring it up is just because it happened just a couple years before Aaron disappeared and might have been some bad blood there. Uh, we just can't be sure. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And this so, is why so many of Aaron's friends, I must have been told by half a dozen of his friends, said, do you think he's in the witness relocation program because of this right here, because of this um, no. testifying? No. And um, I asked the police over and over, and they say no. So I don't, I, I don't think, so. think he is. No. Yeah, I don't need Not that. for something of like that. Yeah. Um, now, there is another court case. It does involve the disappearance of uh, Jeremy Burt, possibly. 
Mm-hmm. Um, with and that's a case we're going to cover next week, and the listeners will have to judge that for themselves. And uh, I've already conducted that interview, and Aaron's name comes up uh, quite often in this other interview that I did regarding uh, Jeremy Burt's disappearance. But uh, just to touch upon it very quickly, Aaron was asked uh, to uh, testify or somehow involved in the trial of Jeannie Burt, where she had forged a judge's signature. Uh, what part did Aaron or did part did not Aaron not play in that? Um, her, yeah, and her name is Jeannie Braun. Jeannie Braun, thank you. Yeah, you said yeah. Yeah, Jeannie Braun and um, Jeannie Braun uh, Harris or something now, uh, but uh, Jeannie was Constance's best friend. And long story short, she approached Aaron and asked him to lie for her in court. And he said no. And not only did he say no, he went to his attorney with it. And then uh, I've been told he went to the prosecuting attorney and Mm -hmm. said, you know, she's approached me with um, financial gain, sexual favors, uh, any kind of um, enticement to lie for her. And I said no. And then she, yeah, she eventually was in trouble. And so she could have. Hmm? She was di- she was disbarred, so she definitely could have an axe to grind uh, against Darren. I don't know, and I'll let you cover that in your other Next. interview. But uh, there, and, and unlike um, Wayne Barbudo, who I believe made a mistake and is a criminal, um, she's much uh, darker. Okay, so there's two different cases that Aaron was uh, kind of involved in. One where he actually had to go into court and. And sit up there by the judge and answer questions. But in in Janie Braun, Jeannie Braun's case, he didn't have to do anything like that. No, he didn't. No. Oh, okay. Now, this is a question that I ask virtually every guest, uh, at least in when we have our first conversations. And when I asked you this question, um, you gave me a, a surprising answer. But I asked you. Who had the most to gain from Aaron disappearing? And what did you tell me? When I put just everything out on the table, trying not to be a stage show mom and and uh, feelings and all, I think the person that had the most to gain was the mother of his young son because they were in a custody battle. She had been forced to bring the child from... She wanted to move to Seattle, so... The judge said, fine, you want to take that son away from his father, you will have to bring him back to Boise every other week. So every other week, she had to go from Seattle to Boise so that Aaron could have his visitation. Plus, she had to put a computer, a baby cam, in his room so that Aaron could see him um, when he was in the room, of course, whenever he wanted. And she was furious about that. And whenever she and Aaron were together, for the most part, they got along okay, even during the struggle. But whenever she was with her boyfriend, who she eventually married and moved to Seattle to live with, whenever he was around, she was a basket case. She was nervous and um, and would scream at Benj. And when they would handle hand the kid back and forth, the little boy, uh, She'd be screaming at him, and and so he, the husband, her new husband, hated Benj. I think it was because it was his child, Aaron's child. But um, they actually got along okay in exchange for the baby doll because their husband was never around, and they uh, they got along okay. She was the one that filed the missing persons report when the police wouldn't return my call. I don't think that Tracy did anything, but the, it got a little interesting years later after Ben disappeared. Her husband is John Parstenbo, and John lived in Seattle, and Tracy took um, the three-year-old child over to Seattle to live with John, and then eventually John's parents died, and he inherited quite a bit of money. At that time, John and Tracy and Ian, the little boy, moved back to Boise, and he invested in real estate. And one day, the police called me to tell me that John Thorstenbo had been arrested for 
child uh, pornography, a very ugly child pornography. And she is now a registered sex offender living in Orlando, Florida. And uh, after he got out of jail, Tracy uh, stayed with him and they moved to Orlando, which was her original childhood home. So, uh, so he goes to, able. so please, please continue. I just said, I don't know where they are and I've not been able to see my grandson since he was three years old. He's now 16. So just to make this clear, um, Aaron has a daughter whose name is Geneva and how old is she now? Geneva turned 20 in the spring. Okay. And Aaron thou also has a son the woman that you're talking about, and his name is, his son's name? Ian, and Ian. he is 16. He needs to be 16, and you haven't seen him since he is three years old. Right, the mother wouldn't let me see him. As soon as Aaron disappeared, she said, nope, he doesn't need you as a grandma. And a good grandma, you can ask Geneva. She, uh, she and I have uh, stayed in touch. We're very close. Uh, she's 20. She just got married um, a year and a half ago, and is going to have a baby any day. Oh my! Okay, good for her. Good yeah, for her. Very young, twenty kid. years old. Wow, twenty. Okay. Um, but and just so the listeners understand, the mother of Ian took this guy back after he went to jail for child pornography. Yes, he could have gotten as many as seventy years, ten counts. And each count had up to seven years that he could have gotten. And they gave him six months. And he was out in six months. I don't know when they moved, but uh, they moved from Eagle, Idaho, which is an out, you know, as, uh, part of greater Boise metropolitan area, and uh, moved to Orlando. And I don't know where in Orlando, if they're still in Orlando, but this was just recently discovered. All this time, I thought my grandson was in Boise. I had plans to sort of connect with him at some point, but uh, he's in Florida now, I think. Okay. Um, has that, the mother of Ian or the mother of Geneva ever offered any ideas on their own? I know, once again, I know you haven't talked to at least one of them for a long time. At the time that Aaron disappeared, did any, either of them offer up, a, offer up a reason that Aaron might have disappeared? Did they have any insight into it? Tracy was, um, Tracy, the mother of Ian, uh, was horrible and wouldn't talk to me. And um, we we just clashed right then. I think we were both emotional. and um, But she cut me off and she'd always promised she'd never do that because um, Geneva's mother, the, the daughter, was killed in a car crash when Geneva was right. six months old. So Geneva oh, right, has lost right, both right. parents. Right. And uh, and when Tracy became pregnant, I said, please don't ever cut me off because, um, you know, I love my grandchildren. She said she would never, never do that. And she did it immediately after Aaron disappeared. But the people that, the aunt and uncle that um, had custody of Geneva um, let me see her and stay in touch with her. And then over the years, we, we became very, very close. So. Okay. A lot of a lot of um, players around Aaron, Vicky. A lot of people. Um, it's a tangled web. It is. It is web. like it's looking down like it has played a spaghetti. It is all these different yeah. strands intertwined. Who knows where they lead? You know who knows where they lead. Yeah, that's why in the end, the, um, the police looked into a lot of different theories. There were so many that they said, okay, we're just going to take it back to the basic, the closest. They did go to Seattle and interview Tracy and her husband. Um, I don't know what that interview said, but um, they did not pursue that line. And Tracy is maybe um, um, controlling, but I don't think she's an evil person. So... I uh, don't think that she uh, killed Aaron or had him killed. Uh, John, I don't know about. Um, would would he? Would John and or Tracy have been in Boise, Idaho, the day that Aaron disappeared? Tracy was yes. Tracy was because Aaron had custody of his son that weekend, yeah. and he took Ian to Tracy at their designated. Um, 
nitrogen oak site uh, at McDonald's uh, on Overland and Cole. He took the child to be with the mom that evening because he was going to go meet his friend Mike. Right, and that goes and way back to the beginning of this, the, way back to the beginning of this long conversation. Right, that's right. He yeah. he brought his son back early. Yeah, and Tracy and he, although they weren't uh, great friends at that point, they did. Um, you know, switch the baby out back and forth without fighting and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so um, she actually, when he didn't show up and I called her, she said, no, he didn't come pick Ian up like he was. And that was extremely, extremely rare after having gone through a custody battle. He wouldn't have done that. And he, and you know, the child had been brought to Boise to visit with him. So, um, and he wouldn't even have gone out that night except that he hadn't seen Mike for months and months and months. He was a dear friend of his. Mm-hmm. So he took the baby back for the evening and then was going to pick him up the next morning and never did. And I think Tracy stayed in town longer and visited with her sister and because of what happened to Aaron. And then eventually we both reported the missing on the same day and, and she went in and they took it, the missing person report from Tracy. Yeah, and we have to remember that Tracy did file a missing persons report. It yeah, wasn't I like she think... blew it off. I mean, she didn't know exactly what happened or anything, but she did go in and mm-hmm. filled something out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't I don't think she had anything to do with it, but at this point, I don't know. You know, mm-hmm. there's just so many people involved, and Bench had a wide network of friends, and they knew each other, and it just honestly looks like a plate of spaghetti. You're absolutely right. Right, and we and the only reason we talk about the ex-wife also is because of this John guy, and he ended up going to jail for a while for for child porn. You know, could it have been maybe that Aaron somehow found out that that guy was involved in that? You know, and the, you know we just we just don't know. It's just a just a question that that's a possibility. Um, has Yvette, who I think is completely innocent in all of this, ever offered up her own theory to you as to what might have happened to Aaron? Yes, many times, um, and we disagreed at times because in the beginning, he was a very close friend of hers. They talked 10 times a day, sometimes for hours on the phone. They were like best friends at the time. Um, and uh, her, her, she had a couple of girls that living at home, and um, one was, I don't know, maybe 15 or so, and the other littler one was 11, 12, 13, something like that. And uh, they would watch movies together. They loved Aaron and um, he he enjoyed them and so when he disappeared that whole group that trio were very upset and Yvette um, was concerned about the animals she's an animal rights person and mm. was taking care of the dog and, and trying to find the cat and she was um, uh, she put um, paper under the wheel of the car to make sure if it was moved we would know you know print and um, she was helping me sort things out. She initially hired the private investigator, even. She was very concerned for Aaron, and she thought he was alive. I had this dark, sinking feeling from the very beginning that he wasn't because it, it was not like him to not answer his phone. Sure. And her theory, she thought he was alive for the longest time. I didn't. She would take something that she learned. She would take it one way. I would take it another but but we worked together uh, sharing information initially. And through the, I haven't been in touch with her now for about a year, and, and it had been years in between. Um, she moved a lot. Uh, so I have not been able to reach her. I would love to get hold of her. But, um, but she was helpful in the beginning, even though we didn't agree with what had happened. And did she offer ever up, up, up her own theory as to what happened? If you can say, if you feel comfortable saying. In, in, yeah, in the beginning, she always thought he was alive. Mm-hmm. Um, Has that, I'm and, going to guess that's changed I don't know that we ever, I don't, I don't know that we ever had a real theory at the time. We both agreed that Ty, Tyler, if he didn't do something, he knew something. Mm. Same with Jason Coley. If he didn't do something, he knows something. And so... Um, we agree on that, but uh, well, I think we both agree that he's probably not alive now. Last time we talked, you know, we mentioned the cell phone. I just want to put this on the record. Did the police ever 
track down um, the pings for Aaron's phone. When was where was the last ping? And we know the phone eventually ended up back in his house, but it wasn't there originally when Yvette went over there. Did it ever ping anywhere? Anything like that? Do you know that information? Well, remember initially we had um, uh, the detective Morgan who wouldn't do anything. Mm. And it wasn't until, you know, six, seven months later that we kept bringing up all these points. And eventually, uh, after the fact, they have to go through quite a rigmarole to get those records. But they were able to get information. Plus, I had Aaron's phone. Uh, remember, it showed up on his desk. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I grabbed it. And I wrote down all of the phone numbers uh, that were called out. And I called every one of those people and talked to them. And then all of the calls that came in, and I called every one of those people and talked to them. And uh, I gave all of that information over to the police. And eventually they did some things between not only Aaron, but other people of interest as well. And where did so Aaron's did where did Aaron's ping? Where did the la- when was the last time that it pinged off any tower in the area? I don't. That was not information that was shared with me. I know the calls, but I don't know uh, the ping. And then his phone. Remember, the battery was taken out of it. So I think whoever harmed him was smart enough to um, take the battery out. Fairly quickly. Yeah, dislodge the battery immediately, and so I'm not sure that they know that. But his last call, we know, was on his way home, just a block or two from his house, with Tyler. Right. Vicky, I know you told me in like about the first seven years, you worked on on your son's disappearance very, very heavily, and then um, it just took a very emotional toll on you. Of course, you were working at the time. You had other things to take care of in your life, but you you backed away uh, from it for a while. Uh, I know the last 13 years have been very difficult. The hardest, yes, it has. The hardest part was I, I did work it. I worked it, and, and I think other people of the missing will tell you this. It's always emotional, but for me, and I think for many of them as well, if you can stop thinking about your loved one and just talk about the mystery that you're trying to solve. You can get into your head at least for short bouts of time. And for eight years, I worked this case, the first seven probably every single day of my life. And uh, long weekends and phone calls and trips and everything. And then I hit dead ends. I mean, you just keep finding the same stuff over and over and then you couldn't reach people anymore because of phone numbers and it became harder and harder. So I would just normally Google my son or the friends and see if I could find anything new. And eventually I just was not finding anything new at all. And I was losing contact with people because phone numbers had changed. And so um, it was... Uh, working it less aggressively. And then um, I got laid off from a job I'd had for 16 years as the company got into financial trouble. I worked in the travel industry and I was laid off from Osamano Travel here in Portland and um, was without a job for about 11 months, never having been unemployed before. So I was looking for a job, spending most of my time doing that. And then I eventually was hired by AAA and the job I took was a great job, great organization, but a very, very heavy workload. And all this time, I'm 13 years older now, and I could not, I could not do that job, come home exhausted, and then look for binge. It was more than I could handle. So the hardest decision I ever made was to stop and turn it over to God and occasionally would search something. But for four years, for lack of energy... I could not work the case. And now I've retired and I'm getting back into it and have found this wonderful Ed Denso and others. I know that guy. Yeah, (laughs) it's all coming back to me now. That's why the timeline's a little fuzzy. I'm going through all my records. The one thing I thank God for is that I had the presence of mind in this terrible um, shock that you are in when this happens to write everything down. And I asked 
uh, Robert and my vet to write everything down when they went into the house and other people to write things down. And now I'm going back to all those notes and finding things I'd forgotten about. Um, and so we are kicking up this case again. Friends of mm-hmm. Aaron's actually uh, started a Facebook page for him. I've seen it. Uh, right before I retired. And it was, the timing was bad because I was trying to wrap up my job and I wasn't ready to get involved, but it was sort of felt a little bit um, forced in a good way to get involved. And now that I've, I've been retired for a few months, I'm uh, reorganizing the office and getting ready to go after this full time again. Great. Um, Great. So I thank you for your participation, Ed. I, I appreciate that. Aaron has a new website, by the way. His old website that was very dynamic was taken down years ago by accident um, and nothing was saved. The person that owned the server um, got rid of the server and lost everything. Mm-hmm. And it hit during that time where I was um, unemployed. I had no money, of course, to build a website. And then I got busy with my new job and it was more than I could do. So we've just built a new website. It's not anything fancy, but uh, it does have this story on it to someone. And it, we're going to be opening a forum. Unfortunately, it's not working right now. So um, I'll talk to Wix and we'll get the forum going. And the website is um, helpfindaaron.net. And Aaron is spelled oddly. It's A-H-R-E-N. It's helpfindaaron.net. And... Uh, it gives the name of the police officer working the case an opportunity to contact me directly. Uh, also, it's got Crime Stoppers phone number as well as the police's phone number. And at this point, I just have to say, Ed, absolutely, I would like whoever hurt my son to be accountable at some day. But okay. right now, I just want to find my son. That's yes. top priority. And if somebody right. wants to give a tip anonymously, God love them, anonymously works for me. I just want to find my son. It's the not knowing, right? It's the not knowing that's the tough part. It is the not knowing. And it's also... It's also the guilt of being the mother and I can't find my son. And it's the guilt of not working the case for four years while I was working. And it's, you know, it's not knowing, but it's also being scared to be hurt. Was it quick? And how come somebody can throw him away like trash? You know, it's, all those things are you know, trying to them out, but they come back all the time. But it's, and it's the inability to grieve because I don't feel like I could just, well, can't find him so long, too bad, move on. She deserves to be found. Yes. Well, uh, you, of course, at least have one more person on your side, and that's me. Thank uh, you. You know, I've been, we've been talking for a few months now, uh, you know, and I, I'm I'm very happy that, Aaron's case is going to be the first one covered on Unfound for the year 2018. Uh, I'm going to always be on your team, and I know the listeners are going to, a lot of people maybe who haven't heard about Aaron or his disappearance, they're all going to know about it. They're going to be on your team as well. You never know who's going to hear uh, this show, and there are so many people who knew Aaron uh, whether they were a friend of his or maybe they were uh, know some of these people that we've talked about, Tyler, Constance, Andy, they could hear it. Maybe they know something that after all these years they feel like coming forward, and that's the exact reason I do this program. Thank you. And, you know, it, this it, truly, there's so much information in this case. And your, your listeners may be lost because you need a map, a roadmap. To now, my listeners... People, but- my listeners are pretty smart. Uh, I'm sure they've followed it pretty well, even though this has been pretty long. That's fine. Okay. Well, I, I was just going to say I'm grateful for that. And it, there may be someone that knows the, the tiniest little piece of information that can be the linchpin that unravels this whole thing. And I just encourage anyone that knows something to please share it. If you want to stay anonymous, even if you email me directly, you want to be anonymous, anonymous, on anonymity works for me. I do not have to tell the police. Uh, even when I did turn in an anonymous letter, I made a deal with the police not to um, hinder this person in any way if they found out who it was, which we did not. 
Okay. You said that there's a Facebook site for Aaron. Uh, why don't you give the name of that out as well? It's a Facebook page uh, started by uh, his friends, and uh, it's Aaron Benjamin Barnard, A-H-R-E-N, Benjamin Barnard, B-A-R-N-A-R-D on Facebook. So just Google his name, and it will take you there. They are very... and. Hmm. <laughs> I just like other words, but they do not want any names mentioned. Um, they just want people to come forward. Okay. And if you want to discuss it, it's okay, but with no names. I think that frightens them, and um, nobody wants to get sued. Today we've mentioned lots of names, but the names are what we know, um, what we've been told. All what we're we doing is stating facts. That's It's just facts. That's exactly. all it is. That's all it is. Exactly. I'll, I'll say it again. I've said it before. I'll say it again. These are just the facts. I can't help it if it makes some of these people look suspicious. These are just the facts. Yes, exactly. the, the facts are their problem, not mine. Yes, exactly. Well said. Mm. But you can find Aaron on Facebook. Um, and primarily, um, the loving friends that did this, I appreciate it so much. They basically are encouraging every day somebody just to come forward and say something. And soon in Boise, if they're not up already, we'll have some billboards Um and uh, sometimes that has stirred things up. Other times it's done nothing. But I'm hoping now that with your podcast and with his anniversary date, that please put out a um, announcement. And um, with the billboards and the TV stations have covered him recently too, that maybe we have a new um, new energy to yeah. encourage someone to come forward. Okay, great, great. Uh, any last words before we conclude this interview, Vicki? Just that I thank you so much, Ed, for um, for doing this, for the insight that you've given me. You've given me some new thoughts on this through your experience and your, um, your instinct. And I appreciate your readers. I've read a number of uh, articles that you've posted and listened to your podcast. Uh, they're well done, and, and uh, I appreciate uh, the people that are listening. Thank you. Vicki, thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Vicki Barnard, mother of Aaron Benji Barnard. I thank her for being on the program. One question I forgot to ask Vicki during the interview that we cleared up afterwards was, did Tyler ever give a reason for that call that Saturday on December 4th? Remember, he was asking Aaron to come home. Why was he doing that? Nobody knows. Tyler never has told Vicky the reason or the police or anybody else to her knowledge. So you should consider that while you're thinking about this case. And yes, if you check the counter on your podcast player right now, it says three colon something. Yep, this episode is over three hours. But I think you can understand why that is. There was no filler in that interview. Nothing but facts and analysis of them. It will be up to you to figure out if any of them, or all of them, or none of them, are relevant to Aaron's disappearance. But before you do that, you may want to wait until you hear next week's episode, The Disappearance of Jeremy Burt, because these two guys, Jeremy and Aaron, knew each other. Not well, they weren't best friends, but they and their girlfriends went to a wedding together. It's proof that they knew each other. And the key, Aaron's former girlfriend and business partner, Constance, and Jeremy's girlfriend and a person of interest in his disappearance, Jeannie Braun, Jeannie and Constance were and are best friends. In fact, you may want to listen to this episode again, maybe next Wednesday or Thursday, right before I release Jeremy's episode. So you can think about Aaron's case as you learn about Jeremy's. You'll need to decide. Are Aaron's and Jeremy's disappearances related? And is it even possible that Aaron's disappearance, in a way, actually caused Jeremy's disappearance? I want you to think about that. Until then, if you're a Patreon subscriber, you'll be able to read my opinions on Aaron's disappearance as a standalone case right now. And I plan to do some general analysis of both cases together after the Jeremy Burt interview on the actual podcast next week. 
along with additional written coverage on Patreon. Once again, next Friday, January 12, 2018. With that, I'll leave you to think about the disappearance of Aaron Barnard. You have a lot to chew on. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a five-star review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.